CEO, OSTA, Sunalei. Welcome and good morning. My name is Anway Gross, and I have the honor of serving as the Executive Director for the Oklahoma Policy Institute. Thank you for joining us today for our State Budget Summit in its eighth year. I was hopeful that we would be able to host our first event of 2022 in person. However, holding the summit virtually was the best way we could ensure the health and safety of our participants and attendees during the recent upswing of COVID-19 in our communities. We look forward to the opportunity to gather in person soon. Here at OK Policy, budget and revenue policy analysis has long been one of our signature strengths. We organized the summit because state revenue and the state's budgeting process are so important. Without adequate funding, there is no way that Oklahoma can deliver on the shared services upon which we all rely, including roads and bridges, public schools, healthcare, public safety, and so much more. Understanding how our state budget process works, however, can be daunting even for the most seasoned policy observer. We want to help you better understand this vital government process, as well as to equip you with the tools to achieve change. While demystifying the budget process, we also want to encourage state leaders to increase transparency and to shine a light on the legislative decisions that shape state revenue. By increasing civic engagement for everyday Oklahomans, our state will be better served because residents can provide informed feedback to elected officials on how our state brings in revenue and expands tax dollars. OK Policy has long argued for a state budget that is centered on publicly discussed needs-based focus for every state agency and program. By shifting to proactive funding based on Oklahoma's actual needs and opportunities, we can better support our citizens and focus on systemic solutions to poverty. In the fall, we published A Better Path Forward, a one-of-a-kind look at Oklahoma's state and budget revenue systems. Our comprehensive report, authored by Dr. Paul Shin and Emma Morris, looks at our current state of affairs, the legislative decisions that got us to this point, and most importantly, it examines more than 30 solutions to stabilize revenue and ensure that all Oklahomans pay their fair share to make our tax system more equitable for everyone. And this week, we released our companion report to A Better Path Forward, examining how Oklahoma fares in terms of budget transparency, as well as what we can do differently to make our budget process more transparent and more democratic. Through this work, we want to start conversations that can help strengthen our state. Working together, we can ensure that Oklahoma's annual state budget and the revenue systems that underpin it can better provide essential public services, level the playing field along racial and economic lines, and allow our state to make meaningful investments in our future success. Those conversations continue today. For this morning's event, we have assembled an expert group of speakers and panelists who can shine a light on the Oklahoma budget. We'll start with a presentation about how Oklahoma's current budget and revenue position looks and take a look at revenue solutions. That will be followed by a panel discussion that includes lawmakers from both sides of the aisle, a tribal representative, and an expert who has long been in the trenches of the Oklahoma budget process. We will conclude our morning with our keynote speaker and our esteemed guest, Angie Cooper with Heartland Forward. Before moving on with the program though, I wanna take a minute to acknowledge that our ability to hold events like this would not be possible without the support of countless folks who know that Oklahoma can and should do better when it comes to making our state a place where everyone can thrive. OK Policy occupies a unique space in Oklahoma as the state's only nonpartisan policy organization in a wide range of state issue areas. As a 501c3 nonprofit, our work could not happen without the support of individuals like you, whose gifts ensure we can continue to provide programming like this alongside the nonpartisan reports and policy analysis that we're known for. 
We appreciate the support of each of you attending today. As a small matter of housekeeping, if you have any questions during the course of this morning's event, you can submit them via the Zoom's chat function. We have planned question opportunities following the initial budget presentation and during the panel discussion. However, time does not permit for us to take questions following our keynote. Now, without further delay, let me introduce our first speaker. Emma Morris has been a rising star with OK Policy for the past few years. She started her tenure with us as a policy intern in both healthcare and revenue, and she quickly contributed to and published pieces in both of those vital areas. She was later named as a healthcare policy fellow to help more deeply explore issues related to health policy in our state, specifically working on issues related to Medicaid expansion. In April 2021, we hired her as our healthcare and revenue policy analyst. During the past year, she has co-authored our Better Path Forward report and its recently released companion report on budget transparency. She has also been interviewed by national publications and has participated in state and regional panel discussions. It is my honor to welcome my colleague, Emma Morris. Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. All right, thanks everyone so much for being here today. Um, as Anwik said, my name is Emma Morris. I'm a policy analyst at OK Policy, and I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. So let's go ahead and get started. Today, we're going to start by talking about why fiscal policy matters. Then we'll take a look at the state budget and talk about the real life impacts that that budget has on everyday Oklahomans. And finally, we'll look to the future and discuss how we can best move forward in making our state a better place to live. For a deeper dive into the history or some of the context around the state budget, you can find our report, A Better Path Forward, on our website. But today, I'm not going to force you to listen to me talk about the super detailed intricacies of the state budget. Instead, I want us to think big picture. How does the state budget impact the lives of our friends and our neighbors? What does it mean for the folks across town, um, for the people who teach our kids, and for those who ensure that our society functions every day? Why does the budget matter and why should we care? So let's zoom out and we'll start with that question of why. Fundamentally in this photo are the reason why fiscal policy matters. Oklahoma's future depends on what we do now, right? How are we investing in our kids? How do we support all parents to help them raise healthy, happy children? How do we make sure that quality public education is accessible and that every kid here can see their doctor so that they can thrive in the future? And on the other side, fiscal policy also immensely impacts our present, our everyday lives. Um, so do these kids have enough to eat? Are their parents making a living wage? Do they have quality teachers who are willing to stay in the state? The way that we tax and spend in Oklahoma is important because budgets determine what governments can or can't do. And especially in this year with a larger than usual state budget, we have an opportunity to think about what these kids need and how we might be able to start meeting those needs. We need to have an open discussion about what Oklahoma could look like. So let's start by looking at an overview of Oklahoma's state budget. And remember, this isn't all of the money that's spent in Oklahoma. This is just what's available to the legislature for appropriation. So it excludes things like federal funds that are spent in the state, as well as some things that are directly deposited um, from, our, from our state tax revenue. Millions in off the top deposits are earmarked for things like scholarships for low-income students and for certain health programs. And once these earmarks are statutorily approved, um, the funds are typically not reviewed annually. Ultimately, bringing all of the money that's spent in Oklahoma into the state budget would give Oklahomans a better picture of the state's financial condition, but for now, we'll talk about the state budget as it currently is. So this is the money that our legislators have the most influence over and the money that really shows what they're prioritizing. First and foremost, we have to recognize that our state's investment in public services is shrinking. Let's look first at just fiscal year 2000 to 2022. That's the dark blue line on the slide. So when we adjust for inflation and for population growth, our state budget 
lost about 23% of its spending power during that time. That's 23% fewer services in the forms of roads, textbooks, teachers, and childcare assistance. That's less funding for corrections, for common and higher education, and for healthcare. And those cuts have had measurable and harmful impacts on Oklahomans. Now let's also look at the projection for this coming year, fiscal year 23, which is shown in the light blue on the slide. The number is still a projection, but wanted to include it because um, it will sort of determine what we can do this year. The number on the slide is shown in 2021 dollars, um, as that's the most recent inflation data that's available. But the bottom line is that this year, the state is projected to have just over $10 billion to appropriate. And while that's still less than it was in the year 2000, it is the highest that we've seen since 2010. So that sounds encouraging, right? Maybe, but let's use history as a guide here. Um, we've seen a few different increases throughout the years, but we've always seen a valley afterwards. And what's more, we've never gotten back to that high point of the year 2000. It's like we got on a roller coaster in 2000, and while we've hit a few high points since then, we haven't made it back to the top. Oklahomans haven't suddenly needed 23% fewer shared services. As we'll talk about later, Oklahomans haven't even really benefited from these revenue decreases. And these decreases are the result of conscious choices that our state has made to reduce the amount of revenue that's available. Let's talk about why that is. How did we get here? First, the passage of state question 640. Passed in 1992, the state question stipulates that a bill to raise revenue can only become law with the three-fourths approval of both legislative chambers or by a majority vote of the people. Now, it might make some sort of sense to have some sort of limit on what a legislature can and can't do, but we have to remember that this is one of the most restrictive tax limits in the country. Only nine states have something similar, and only Arkansas is as strict as ours. And notably, there's no similar requirement to lower taxes, meaning that we can cut taxes when it's politically popular, but it's almost impossible to raise revenue again when the state needs it. Only one major revenue raising bill has passed the legislature since enactment of state question 640. And all of these things together have contributed to the eight revenue failures that the state has seen since 2000. State question 640 has had two important but negative impacts since its passage. First, it's made it much harder to raise taxes than to lower them, which effectively ensures that we'll never return to the previous levels of revenue as we saw in the previous graph. And the second thing is that has, it has largely kept the state from the opportunity to make meaningful public investments for economic growth. In conjunction with state question 640, we've seen reduced tax revenue across the board. This is because of reductions in both the individual and the corporate income tax and the elimination of some taxes entirely. So to put some numbers on it, think of it this way. You have $100. In 2004, you paid about $9.20 in taxes of, on that $100. In 2018, you paid just $8.30 on that $100. And that might seem like a small decrease for you individually, right? But when you add that up for every taxpayer, it's a lot of lost tax revenue. And don't get me wrong, there are definitely some Oklahomans who see that as a good thing. But we have to remember that every dollar of tax reductions means one less dollar that's available to fund the services on which we all rely. As we've reduced tax revenue, we've also increased the amount of tax breaks and incentives that are available to some Oklahomans. So there's sort of two layers here. The first layer is corporate incentives. These go to businesses, usually under the pretext that they'll create jobs or increase economic growth. Um, they're primarily benefiting wealthy Oklahomans or out-of-state companies, and they cost the state a significant amount of revenue. In Oklahoma, we love to talk about the free market, but business incentives are fundamentally oppositional to that idea. Incentives let us determine which industries will benefit or succeed, and often they don't even work. In fact, the Incentive Evaluation Commission, the IEC, or the group created by the legislature to evaluate incentives, has found that several of the state's incentives just aren't working. 
For example, the IEC's 2021 report states that the return on investment of the capital gains deduction is actually negative for the state. And the report says, quote, the foregone revenue would generate substantially greater employment and economic impacts statewide if these revenues were spent as part of the Oklahoma budget, end quote. Unfortunately, the legislature hasn't acted on many of the IEC's recommendations to repeal or reform several of the state's incentives. So the second part of this part is, is tax breaks that go to certain groups of Oklahomans. As an example, all social security benefits are exempt from income tax in Oklahoma. Literally everyone who receives social security from the couple making $20,000 annually to the few billionaires that we have in the state they are all exempt from income tax on any social security money they're receiving. And that's actually not normal in other states. Um, a lot of other states exempt only a portion of social security benefits. So our universal exemption is problematic for two reasons. One, there's no comparable exemption for working age folks. So the tax system is very disproportionately benefiting retirees. And two, because it's a universal exemption, retirees with higher incomes are getting a disproportionately large tax break compared to retirees who are lower income or closer to the poverty line. And we can make our system more equitable by targeting these tax breaks to seniors who really need the help. None of these, not business incentives or tax breaks for, for groups of people are free. Every time we expand a tax break for a business, many of which would have come here anyway, or for a very specific group of people, we have to think about the trade-offs for our society at large. And finally, Oklahomans have less say in how their money is spent now. And I wanna preface this by saying that this is not necessarily a result of current lawmakers' decisions, but rather these choices have been made slowly and over time, often for reasons that make some kind of sense in the moment. But objectively, the process is less transparent now. There are fewer budget bills, the budget is introduced later in session, and it's introduced and passed often in the span of just a few days. That's, again, not normal. Most other states take much more time and involve many more people in their budget process. Perhaps most egregiously, um, there's no opportunity for public comment in Oklahoma. So in many other states, people can speak publicly at budget hearings, but we don't have that opportunity in Oklahoma. If Oklahomans had more opportunities to participate and to feel like their voices were actually being heard, the budget situation might look different. And you know, maybe it wouldn't, but we don't know because we haven't given people that opportunity. So in the abstract, fiscal policy can sometimes sound maybe boring, maybe unimportant. When I tell people that I work on tax policy, like their eyes usually glaze over. But this really does have impacts on the lives of every Oklahoman. To put it plainly, we're investing less in Oklahomans across the state. And this has had tangible and detrimental impacts for people around us. A few examples. Because we failed to invest in the needs of Oklahomans, more than 5,000 people are waiting for services that they need to live their everyday lives. In 2018, there were more than 1,000 uninsured births, meaning people are giving birth and then leaving the hospital with no insurance. It wouldn't take much on the state's part to ensure that all of these people had access to coverage, yet we've chosen not to make that a priority. More than 80% of our state funding for district courts comes from fines and fees, not from state revenue, which is contributing to immense racial and economic inequality in the state. On average, we spend about $1,400 less per pupil than the average of our surrounding states. As a result of not funding things like mental health and affordable housing, we have the 12th highest suicide rate in the nation, something that has likely only gotten worse since the pandemic began. And we fail to support our workers. There are 28,000 Oklahomans who are making minimum wage or less. And that often means that they can't afford basic living expenses. Alternatively, we know what happens when we as a state choose to invest in our neighbors. Because Oklahoma voters chose to expand Medicaid, because the legislature fully funded it, and because the healthcare authority committed to implementing it correctly, in less than a year, more than 240,000 Oklahomans have new access to comprehensive 
and affordable health coverage through Medicaid. We also have one of the highest rates of preschool attendance in the nation with more than 40,000 three and four year olds in preschool. For four year olds, we rank fifth in the nation for preschool access. In 2018, legislators overcame the state question 640 requirements for the first time on a major revenue raising bill to invest in kids and teachers across the state. And just this last year, the legislature restored refundability of the earned income tax credit, returning up to $279 to many working Oklahomans. This money will be almost entirely and immediately spent locally and circulated in communities around the state of Oklahoma. Further and evidenced by the previous examples, public spending actually does more for the economy than tax cuts do. So this graph is showing the economic impacts of cutting spending versus raising revenue. We'll start on the left side of the slide. Um, these economists found that every dollar that you cut in state government spending cuts economic output by $1.50 to $2.50. On the other hand, raising taxes by that same dollar cuts output by just about 35 cents. And alternatively, alternatively on the right side of the slide, Raising that same dollar on wealthy individuals actually increases output by a little over a dollar. Yet in Oklahoma, we've consistently chosen tax cuts over investments. And what do we have to show for it? Let's look. This graph shows the differences between Oklahoma and our surrounding states for six different indicators. I know the graph is a bit wonky. It's got a lot going on, but bear with me. Generally, it's telling us that lower taxes and spending are not boosting our economy. So we'll start on the left side of the slide and you can see that we've cut taxes and spending both more than others in our region. At first glance, when you look just at our growth in output in that third indicator, it appears maybe to have paid off. Unfortunately, that's actually pretty misleading because the growth that we've seen in output has more to do with oil and gas than it does with choices that we've made around tax policy. And anyone who follows the oil and gas industry knows that it's a very volatile and unpredictable industry. So for that reason, let's look at output without oil and gas, that fourth indicator. That actually brings our growth in output to significantly below the regional average. We've also seen less job growth than our neighbors and a slight increase in income. Clearly, cutting taxes hasn't paid off the way that we were promised. What lower taxes and revenue have done, however, is significantly reduce the services that are available to all Oklahomans. So this graph shows the cumulative impacts of tax and spending cuts between the years 2005 and 2020. As you can see, every single income group has felt the impacts of lost services, from worse roads to lower paid teachers to older textbooks and inaccessible childcare. Everyone is impacted when we decide to reduce revenue. These tax and spending choices have also negatively impacted Oklahomans who are making um, the least amount of money. So between 2005 and 2020, tax changes have collectively cost the poorest 20% of Oklahomans about $57 million in lost income. Further, even for lower and middle class Oklahomans who have seen a tax cut, they've lost more in services than they've gained in those cut taxes. So we have to keep this front of mind anytime that we're talking about fiscal policy. There's always a trade-off when we make these choices. Unfortunately, part of that trade-off has led us here to a very regressive tax system in which low-income Oklahomans pay a much larger share of their income in taxes than their wealthier counterparts. Of course, a millionaire is gonna pay more in total dollar amount, but low-income Oklahomans are paying a larger portion of their income. We often think of Oklahoma as a low tax state, but in reality, we're only a low tax state for some. So when we think about someone's tax responsibility, we need to think about all of the taxes that they're paying, um, income tax, sales tax, and property tax, not just their income tax responsibility. One of the main reasons behind Oklahoma's regressive tax system, and part of the reason that low income folks have paid more in taxes in the last 15 years, is our state's heavy reliance on the sales tax. So we unfortunately rely more heavily on the sales tax than a lot of other states. If you think about it, 
a COVID test costs the same no matter if you make $8 an hour or a million dollars a year. But logically, we all know that the sales tax on that COVID test hits the hourly worker a whole lot harder than it does the millionaire. So one of the questions people ask is, um, you know, what if we had a proportional tax system? Wouldn't that make things more fair if everyone paid the same percentage of their income? And that's a good question. Um, so let's look at what that would mean here in Oklahoma. The chart compares two different people. In the middle column, we have someone making $12,000 a year. And in, in the rightmost column, we have someone in the top 5% of Oklahomans making about 278,000 a year. The person making 12,000 currently pays 13.2% of her income or about $1,600 in taxes annually. The person making 278,000 pays 7.4% of her income or about $20,000 in annual taxes. So if we move to a proportional tax system, both people would pay about 10.6% of their income in taxes. In practice, that would mean that the person making $12,000 would get a tax cut of $309. And the one making $278,000, she'd pay about $9,000 more each year in taxes. Unfortunately, this gets even more jaw dropping as we move up the income ladder to look at the top 1% of Oklahomans. I show this not to say that we necessarily should have a proportional tax system, but rather to illustrate the magnitude of the regressivity of our current system. Let's talk a little bit about why the system is so regressive. Like I said, we rely a lot on sales tax in Oklahoma and over the last, um, in recent years, more than half of the local governments have had to increase their sales taxes. At the state level, we've increased taxes on cigarettes which again have a disproportionate impact because that pack of cigarettes costs the same no matter who's buying it. The sales tax impacts some a lot more than others. We've also lowered the top income tax rate from 7% to 4.75% over the last two decades. And this may not immediately scream regressive. However, this change requires less of those who can afford to pay. And it's also contributing to the lower revenue and therefore impacting the amount of services that we can provide as a state. And finally, we've also increased several tax exemptions for certain groups of people, and we've eliminated some taxes entirely. Because we have such a regressive tax system, we're also seeing disproportionate impacts on certain groups of Oklahomans. So, I've got a few examples here. We'll start with Oklahomans of color who are overrepresented in the lower income quintiles. So on average, they're paying a higher share of their income in taxes. This is again, primarily because of the difference in sales taxes. You can see in the dark blue box that white Oklahomans pay about 4% of their income in sales tax, while black Oklahomans pay just over 5%. Women are in a similar boat with female householders paying 10.2% of their income in taxes compared to married couples who pay just 8.6. This is mostly due to the fact that women continue to be overrepresented in low wage jobs and unwilling participants in the gender pay gap, as well as the disparity in the sales tax again. Further, this is likely worse for black women, for Latinas, American Indian women, immigrant women, and gender non-binary people. And it's the same story again for Oklahomans living in non-metro areas. So the folks that are living in rural areas are paying a half percentage point more in taxes than those who are living in the OKC metro. Um, just a quick note, this graph shows total tax responsibility and it does include income sales and property taxes, but it's not broken down by category like the others were um, just because of data constraints. Again, um, the disparity here is because incomes tend to be slightly lower in rural areas, so um, rural residents are overrepresented in the lower income quintiles and therefore paying a higher share of income in taxes. I think sometimes it can be easy to look at these numbers and think, so what, you know, what's a half percentage point more, but it really does matter. You know, that could be the difference of an extra week of groceries or the ability to change a flat tire to get to work. The bottom line is that we're disproportionately funding our government and the services that it provides on the backs of those who can least afford it. 
Part of living in a democratic society means that we all pay our fair share to ensure that those around us can survive and thrive. But these numbers remind us that we haven't gotten there yet in Oklahoma. So I mentioned towards the beginning that this year's budget is larger than the budget of the past few years. Though remember that we still have fewer resources available than we did two decades ago. And you know, a lot of, it, Everyone knows that we've got a lot of money coming into the state on top of the tax revenue increases that we're seeing. There's a whole lot of federal money from the CARES Act and from the American Rescue Plan. And that really means that we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to identify the needs of the people around us. We have an opportunity to hear from state agencies about what levels of funding they need to truly meet the needs of Oklahomans. We have an opportunity to take care of each other like we haven't done so far. So the obvious next question, where do we start? I'll talk about a few items today, but if you want a deeper dive, um, again, our report at Better Path Forward explores these and several other possible revenue solutions that can help stabilize and equalize our budget and tax system. You can find that report on our website. So first, we have got to prepare for the future. If you remember the graph from the beginning, like we've been talking about um, this whole time, uh, the state budget high is not going to last forever. Like the chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, Senator Thompson said a few weeks back, we're a state that has mountaintops and valleys. So we're on the top right now, but valleys will return. As I said earlier, Oklahoma has declared revenue failure eight times since the year 2000. Things we do now will determine whether or not we have to do that again after this mountaintop. Doing things like cutting taxes now when it's politically helpful and perhaps easy to justify will come back to bite us in the future when we have to overcome the state question 640 requirements to raise taxes just to maintain basic services. Right now, we can also think about ways that we could sustain this level of increased revenue perhaps by identifying tax expenditures that aren't working and thoughtfully considering how they might be reformed to work better and raise revenue in the process. And finally, we should revisit State Question 640. Thinking now about how to sustain this level of funding will help ensure that the things we invest in today will remain priorities in the future. Next, let's take this opportunity to really think about how we can better support working Oklahomans through our fiscal policy. I laid out a pretty bleak picture earlier about how regressive our tax system is, but there are some quick and straightforward steps we could take this year to make some pretty significant improvements. First, there are some tax credits that primarily benefit working Oklahomans. For example, the sales tax relief credit, which was created to offset the cost of groceries for low-income Oklahomans, hasn't been updated since 1990. And the credit has lost about 60% of its buying power in that time. Of course, we all know that a jug of milk costs a whole lot more now than it did in 1990, but the credit to offset that price hasn't caught up. By significantly expanding this credit, the state could effectively eliminate the state and local sales tax on groceries for those who need the help the most. Another example is the earned income tax credit. Retying that to the federal credit will ensure that it accounts for inflation in future years. And we could also think about expanding the amount of the state credit, which would put more money directly into the pockets of low income Oklahomans. We also have a lot of horizontal inequity in our tax system. And that basically means that folks who are in similar situations with similar incomes and expenses are paying different amounts of taxes. One example of that is renters versus homeowners. So right now, homeowners get an average credit of about $110 a year through the homestead exemption, but there's no similar credit for renters. Creating a credit for all renters across the state would help start to level that playing field. We should also think about how we can fund courts with state revenue rather than with fines and fees. Um, our reliance on fines and fees to fund a basic, a basic function of government, which we will all use at some point in our lives, is something that we could stop this year. What each of these ideas has in common is that they would immediately spread money out into every community in Oklahoma. In both rural and urban areas, these changes would put money back into the pockets of working Oklahomans, many of them low income, 
and that money will be spent locally to support economies around the state. And finally, we need to think critically and thoughtfully about how we can invest in making Oklahoma a better place to live. So we should think about making healthcare more accessible for pregnant and postpartum people. We should think about investing in the state's economic future by increasing funding for public education, including pre-K through 12 and post-secondary institutions. We should think about prioritizing mental health treatment by fully implementing the requirements of state question 781. And we should think about supporting workers by creating a state paid family medical leave program and making childcare more affordable for everyone. One of the reasons that I love Oklahoma is that people care about the folks around them. Oklahomans don't hesitate to drop off clothes at a clothing drive, to give someone a ride to school, to serve a hot meal on Thanksgiving. It's because we recognize the humanity in each other. But our state policies and specifically the way that we tax and spend, they don't always align with the community values that we all feel for each other. The values that so many of us strive to live by each day. Too many of us are living without the things that we need. Too many people are living paycheck to paycheck, struggling by until they can get help, balancing work and no childcare. Too many Oklahomans live without access to healthcare. Too many are incarcerated or justice involved. This year, we have the opportunity to start to rectify that. We can identify needs and we can start to meet them. We can fund priorities that will make Oklahoma a better place to live that will increase opportunity for everyone and ensure that our kids can excel today and in the future. With that, I will say thank you and would love to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Emma. I really enjoyed your presentation. One of the things I, um, I think I admire most about you is you're able to take all of this and condense it into a way that everyone can understand, especially me. Um, and it's, you know, it's my goal. I've talked to the team about this a lot is how do we have a conversation about tax incentives at every kitchen table? Um, so how do we demystify that, right? And make it um, normal speak for everyone. So thank you for leading us through that. I really appreciate it. Um, and one of the things you're going to hear me say a lot about Emma is uh, she's going to be one of those women that in 10 years, I get to say I knew her when. Um, she is truly brilliant and we're really, really lucky to be able to have her on staff. A couple of things I want to point out is some of the items that Emma discussed today are included in our focus on transparency report, which was co-authored by Emma and one of our panelists today, Paul Shen. You can find that on our website. And I encourage everyone to go look at the report. Uh, the QR code has popped up on some of our hold slides and it's on our website at okpolicy.org forward slash budget dash transparency. And I believe we're also gonna be dropping a link in the chat. Um, one of the most frequently asked questions though, Emma, at this point is, will the recording be available? Everyone wants a copy of your slides. And so in short answer, yes. Uh, we will have a recording available following this later today with transcriptions and we'll have a link for her slides on our website. But let's now turn to the fun questions. Ready? Okay, question number one. Legislatures have said that they want to cut corporate income tax this year. Is this a good idea and what other options do they have for tax cuts? That's a really great question. Um, so in short, no, cutting the corporate income tax is not a good idea for our state. It's not something that has been proven to you know, attract businesses, um, to increase economic growth um, in states. You know, when you hear from potential uh, corporations or companies that might be relocating to Oklahoma, you don't hear that they want to have a lower corporate income tax, right? You hear that they want to have quality public schools you hear that they want to drive on roads that are drivable. Um, you hear that they want to ensure that you know, their quality of life is going to be as good as it would be somewhere else. We are not living up to that expectation. Um, and so before we think about further cutting the corporate income tax, we need to think about 
you know, what are the things that are really going to bring people here and how can we make that happen in Oklahoma? Um, a few, I think the second part of the question was about other ideas um, for tax cuts. So I think when we are thinking about um, tax cuts in Oklahoma, we need, we, we saw just now, I hope that I adequately described the, how regressive our tax system is. So when we're thinking about tax cuts, um, we need to think about how they can be targeted, how they can go to people that need the help the most um, to lower income Oklahomans across the state, to working Oklahomans. Um, and again, whenever we put more money in the pockets of low income Oklahomans, we, um, you know, that money is immediately spent. It's spent locally, it's spent in the state. So those are the things that we need to think about um, whenever we're talking about tax cuts. So that leads us right into actually our second question, right? If we're thinking about how tax cuts should be targeted and really focused, we have legislatures on both sides of the aisle that have proposed eliminating the grocery sales tax. Can you talk about what that might mean and what an alternative solution might be? Yeah, again, a great question. Eliminating the grocery sales tax, um, it sounds good, right? Like it sounds like something that everyone, of course, people, ideally, people would love to not pay sales tax on groceries. A lot of other states don't do it. Um, we are one of a few states that still has that tax. So in theory, it sounds good. In practice, um, cutting sales tax from, or removing the sales tax from groceries um, would likely cause long-term and you know, pretty detrimental um, impacts to the amount of revenue that we have available to provide, again, those services that we all use, roads, public education. Um, and so that is something we have to think about whenever we're talking about what kind of taxes do we wanna cut, right? Um, an, an alternative, again, when we're talking about targeted tax cuts, um, that really will help the people that really need them. Um, an alternative to think about is, as I said in the presentation, expanding the sales tax relief credit. That, if, if we were to significantly expand that credit and um, make it available to a few more people, we could effectively eliminate or substantially reduce the sales tax on groceries for people that really need the help, right? Um, for those, of, for Oklahomans who aren't struggling, who are well off, paying sales tax on groceries is a part of making sure that our state can provide the things that we all need. Um, so the sales tax relief credit, a significant expansion would be um, the way to go, in my opinion. Thank you, Emma. So let's talk a little bit. Our new report is around transparency. So we have a question that says, what could we do as Oklahomans to push for better budget transparency? Again, great question. Um, so I think, um, I know it's sometimes a trite answer to say, um, contact your legislature, right? I think a lot of people have done it and some people feel um, like they are really heard and some people feel like I've heard people say that they don't feel like they're heard. So I know that this answer is maybe not what everyone is hoping to hear, but I really do think that um, the more people are talking to their legislators about, the, you know, they want to be involved, um, they want to be able to voice their opinions. Um, I think that's at least a place to start. Something that you hear at the Capitol sometimes is like, no one would come if we gave them the opportunity to speak. And so we really need to um, show our legislators that people would come, people are interested um, in the budget process and we want that opportunity. Thank you, Emma. I'm sorry, I'm busy scrolling through your questions. There are a ton. Um, let's see. Are there any opportunities coming up for us to vote towards improved policy change for anything that you mentioned during the presentation? Great question. Um, so we're about to start legislative session, right? We're seeing all these bills rolling in. We're spending time looking through them and seeing what they would do. Um, so I don't know that there are at this moment, um, like voter initiatives or things that are gonna be on the ballot around these, these um, ideas, but you always have the opportunity to tell your legislator what is important to you. Um, you always have the opportunity to go up there and say, you know, this is what I value and this is what I would like you to do. Um, and then of course, you know, anytime we vote on 
someone who's going to represent us from school board to state legislature to federal office. Um, you know, we're casting a vote for what we want, like how we want to be re represented and what sort of policy change we want to see. So um, definitely keep that in mind as you're making those decisions as well. All right. Let's see our next question. I know for the folks like me that aren't math lovers, it's hard to connect the people person to the percentages. How do we take this information to action in our communities during a pandemic surge where we might not be able to be out? That's a great question. Yeah, that is a really good question. Um, so one of the things I really tried to do today is make it personal, right? So talking about, um, Talking about the numbers, yes, but also talking about what it means in the lives of everyday Oklahomans. I think sometimes there's a disconnect between what, you know, I'm paying taxes and I'm not seeing um, what is being, you know, what they're being spent on. But if you think about it, we are everyday, right? Um, the roads that you drive on, uh, the textbooks that your kids are reading. So anything you can do to make it more personal for people. Um, and to really connect it to, you know, the things they're experiencing every day or the things that their family members are experiencing. I think that goes a long way towards um, sort of bridging that gap. Great. And our last question, what are the best resources for educating our teams about the budget? And I want to, I'm, I'm going to do shameless plugs here for just a second, Emma, then I'll turn it over to you. Uh, so we have a lot of resources at OK Policy. So whoever pitched us this question, thank you. We have our Together Oklahoma team um, that is, has chapters across the state. So regional chapters and also chapters that are focused on specific issues. So if you're interested in learning more or engaging as a community member, you can visit togetherok.org. In addition, we are part of a coalition, Taxpayers for a Better Oklahoma. So any of these pieces that you're really interested in, please let us know because we would love for you to join that coalition work. We know it's going to be um, a lot of fun this session, right, as we think about what are the best options. Emma, is there anything you'd like to add to that about ways that folks can get educated aside from re-listening to your, to your session? Yeah, the only thing I would add, and thank you for answering the question for me, is that, um, you just like start somewhere. Like when I started as an, as, um, an intern a few years ago, like there's, I had no idea about any of this and I did not think that I would be giving this presentation today. Right. So just start somewhere, whether it's reading our report or reading something, um, from a different organization or from the legislature, or just start somewhere and you'll be able to start getting familiar with the terms and, and picking that up as you go. Great. Thank you, Emma. I am not seeing any more questions in our queue. So I'm going to say thank you. Um, and a reminder that this presentation is being recorded. You'll be able to find it later today. And we will have a copy of Emma's slides on our website. So we are now going to move on to our panel discussion for today's event. And it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator and one of my bosses, OK Policy Board Member Jeff Barong of Weatherford. Jeff is a third generation owner in his family's independent insurance agency, Ed Barong Insurance Agency, Inc., which has been in business since 1948 and now has locations in Weatherford and in Edmond. He has enjoyed a lifelong interest in public policy, government, and politics, including serving as a field representative for Oklahoma Congressman Dan Bourne. He is very involved in his community where he has served on the board of directors of the Great Plains Family YMCA, the Weatherford Rotary Club, the Weatherford Area Chamber of Commerce, and the Weatherford Area Economic Development Foundation. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. I uh, think, let's see, everybody can hear me okay? All right, well, I'll, uh, I'll get right to it here, I think, and introduce our panelists. We should have a pretty, assuming I don't mess this up in the virtual environment, we should have a pretty good uh, panel discussion here. Um, let me first off introduce, we'll start, you know, we'll start in the, in the upper house, we'll start in the Senate. Uh, we have on our panel today, Senator Julia Kurt of Oklahoma City. She was elected to the state Senate in 2018 to represent District 30 in Northwest Oklahoma County. She serves on numerous committees, including appropriations, finance, health and human services, 
Rules and Veterans and Military Affairs. And we appreciate you being here with us today, Senator. Next, we've got, uh, you know, here, if we were like all in person, I'd, you know, go down the table and here we are. But now I'm thinking, well, in the, in the little box right under Julia is Representative Kyle Hilbert. And uh, uh, from Bristow, he was elected in 2016 to represent House District 29, which consists of Rural Creek and Tulsa counties. He serves as vice chair of the Appropriations and Budget Committee, as well as vice chair of the Joint Committee on Appropriations and Budget. He is co-chair of the Health and Human Services Working Group of the Joint Committee on Pandemic Relief Funding. Kyle, that was a mouthful. Is that, did I say that right? Just Kyle would have worked, but that was good too. There, there you go. <laughs> and um, he also serves as a member of, of seven other House committees. Next, we have Representative Danny Williams of Seminole. Uh, the, the new kid on the legislative block, I think. He was elected in 2020 to represent House District 28, which includes Pottawatomie and Seminole counties. He serves as vice chair of the Technology Committee, as well as serving on the Appropriations and Budget Subcommittee, um, <clears throat> General Government, Public Safety, and the State and Federal Redistricting South Central Oklahoma Subcommittee. Those are a lot of words. I'm trying to find uh, Representative Williams. Okay, there we go. I see in the, you're there. Um, next, we got Joe B. Hill, who serves the Executive Officer of Governmental Affairs and Partnerships for the Chickasaw Nation, a position he's held since 2019. <clears throat> in this role, he works on legislative and policy issues at federal, state, and local levels, as well as building and maintaining relationships with other Native American tribes. He also focuses on developing community partnerships within the Chickasaw Nation's boundaries. And uh, like, like me, Joe was also a former uh, staffer for Congressman Boren. And there's a lot more we can say about Joe, but I think we'll stop there. So um, our final panelist is Dr. Paul Shin, a retired state and local budget official, uh, which that kind of, there's so much, so much we could say about Paul Shin. So, um, during his career, Paul held budget and financial positions for the Oklahoma House of Representatives, the Oklahoma Department of Human Services, the cities of Oklahoma City and Dell City, and several local governments in his home state of Oregon. From 2019 until his retirement last month, Paul served as OK Policy's budget and tax senior policy analyst and, and special guest at things like this. Along with Emma, he co-authored OK Policy's Comprehensive Budget and Tax Paper, A Better Path Forward, as well as its recently released companion report focused on budget transparency. So um, thank you everyone again for being here and, and thank you. Looks like we've got a really good attendance. I don't know if there's snow on the ground. I've got snow all over out here in Western Oklahoma. So I'm kind of glad this is virtual action. No snow, no snow where Paul's at. So we need the moisture out here. Um, kind of the way this is going to work here, and, and again, if we were in person, I would, uh, it'd be a little easier going down the, the, the table, but um, I'll ask a question, and the question will first be directed to a specific person, but then after that, each person on the panel will have an opportunity to answer. Like I said, if we were in person, I'd probably just go down the table, but in this environment, I'll, I'm going to look at your expressions on the, uh, you know, on the screen, and whoever looks most excited will get the next shot at the question. And I'm going to go from from most excited to least excited at, at the very end. So that you judge your facial expressions. Be, be very careful what your face looks like because you'll get called on. So, um, well, let's go ahead and uh, get. Oh, and also questions for everyone watching online. After we're done with the with the planned portion of the program, you'll have the opportunity to put questions in, and then we can kind of go through those depending upon what our time situation. So, uh, without further ado, we're going to begin again with the Senate. Uh, so we'll begin with Senator Kurt. Uh, first question, and then to go to everybody else afterward. But Senator Kurt, where can and should Oklahoma be making smarter investments in our future success? and what are the best avenues to fund them? Thanks so much. Good morning. I'm thrilled 
Uh, hearing Emma Morris talk about where you start, it reminds me that I actually budget summits are what got me interested in the budget before I got in the legislature. So I'm really honored and thrilled to be here. Um, when we talk about future investments, I mean, I think we have to make the hard decisions for the long term, and that includes focusing on prevention and people. Um, we have to shift our mindset. We have a mountain of need, especially um, looking at the effects of COVID, the mental health effects, um, the economic impacts that will be rippling out. We're not sure exactly how they'll land. Um, when we look at the challenges uh, for our educational system, um, trying to pivot and be uh, resilient in the middle of a pandemic, I know that prevention is even more important and focusing on people. So my, my real emphasis would be to shift from all our crisis spending um, to focusing on prevention spending, be that health, uh, be that serving families who are caregivers. We have a huge crisis um, in caregiving and uh, the challenge of not recognizing its importance in our economy in the past. Um, hopefully we've seen through COVID how much it, it matters uh, how children are cared for, how dependent adults are cared for, um, and we can factor that in going forward. Um, you know, I really would put a lot more into our early childhood, um, K through 12, and higher ed to make sure that we're investing in those long term, long term needs. Uh, I could go on a while, but I'll leave it at that. All right, I'm looking for the the next most energetic person, Representative Hilbert. You're looking pretty energetic this morning. That same well, way to repeat the question, uh, or you you bet. Happy happy to jump in and uh, good morning. Great to be with everybody. I I I fully agree with what Senator Kurt said. You know we've got to be proactive and just not reactive on on things. Um, we we've made a great investment in common education over the past five years since I joined the legislature. We've increased common ed funding thirty three percent over the last five years. Um, it, it took a dip, of course, in twenty twenty when the pandemic hit, but then we jumped it right back up above where it was even before. Um, but um, I know we're going to talk about a lot of high level stuff, but I'd, I'd like to get in the weeds on, on this one just a moment. Um, I, I think one of the things that we need to do is invest in higher education and invest in degrees that we need. Um, no offense, I, I'm certain that I'm going to offend a lot of people. I'm sure there's a lot of political science graduates on the call, but um, you know, we, we don't have a shortage of political science grads, but we do have a shortage of engineers, we have a shortage of nurses, and right now our higher ed institutions are incentivized to not grow their nursing and engineering programs because um, the more they grow them, the more money they lose. Be just the way the funding formula works for higher education. And so um, targeting funding into those areas, which I think, you know, we've got a workforce shortage in those two areas in particular, we've got a teacher shortage. Um, and so that's a little different. Those programs aren't as expensive as teach as engineering and nursing, but we've got to invest in our teacher programs so that we can kind of try to reverse the trend. Um, there was a loft report recently that a lot of people talked about the teacher compensation piece of it, but there were some other pieces of that report that were very interesting. And one of them was that um, our colleges of education are only graduating about 50% as many in education majors each year as we have retirees. And then within five years, half of teachers are leaving the workforce, uh, leaving the teaching workforce. And so we, we've got to invest in those three areas. I think it's critical um, to do those targeted investments. And um, you know, I'm excited to discuss the other topics we've got on the agenda today, but uh, that's the one at the top of my list looking at this next session. And, and Representative Hilbert, I've just I've got to say I'm looking at the the bookshelf behind you there, and I if you, you you could go to the library, you know, and get some and get some books. <laughs> I I am I'm so glad you said that. So actually, um, I'm going to attempt to do this. This is my closet. I'm I'm um, in temporarily. My office on the second floor is getting fixed. Um, I've been telling everyone I ticked off the speaker, so he put me in this little closet on the fifth floor. But uh, my office will be fixed before session starts back. But Yes, that's the reason the bookshelf <laughs> and the decor is so barren here. All right, I'm glad we clarified that. Uh, okay, let's go next to let's go next to Paul. Paul, would you like to answer that? Yeah, first of all, as a political that. science grad, I can tell by the bookcase that Representative Hilbert was not one, and that's a good thing. Um, we need to talk a lot and put a lot more effort into rural Oklahoma, you know, not Oklahoma, but every state in the country, the, the, the divide in the economy and the culture and opportunities is just between 
urban and suburban Oklahomans versus rural ones is, is um, it's gigantic, it's getting worse, and it's hurting our, really it's hurting the soul of our state. Uh, the legislature is working on broadband and it's important to get broadband out there. It's even more important to get affordable broadband out there. Um, and the state's going to have to spend money on a regular basis to bring broadband down to costs that people in places like Guymon and Godibo can afford. It's also important uh, to get more rural kids in great schools, and most rural schools are great schools, but they don't have the technological and other advantage that urban ones do. We need to get those. Uh, our rural programs for chil young children and their families are, are very limited, and we need to put more money into great programs like Children First, which is almost exclusively offered in urban areas. Uh, and the, the ideas that Ms. Morris uh, mentioned about taxes, we need to make our tax system less regressive, and that will put more money in the pockets of rural Oklahomans because rural areas continue to have a huge income gap. Thank you, Paul. Joe, I think, I think you're next. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I don't have a whole lot to add to that. They touched on a lot of very uh, beneficial topics. Uh, couldn't argue with with uh, funding for rural areas or higher ed or anything of that nature. So I, I think a lot of good ideas have already been addressed and, and pushed forward. I like it. Representative Williams, that now we're to you. And I got to say, I love the picture in the background there. We were we had the empty chair there. I was kind of looking at it. I thought, man, that's just a nice piece. It's, again, I, I, it's covered with snow outside here in Western Oklahoma. So that's just I like it, but um, the, you want me to repeat the question for you real quick since- That would, that would be outstanding. You're not from Weatherford, are you? I am from Weatherford, yes, sir. The Brong brothers, you have the insurance company there and former yep, state senator and all that? Yep, that's that. you have a good memory. Which one is your dad? Uh, Brad Barong is my okay. dad. He's okay. And senior's youngest son, yes, yep. sir. Okay. Yep. Well, it's good to see you and uh, say hello yeah, to your to family meet. for me. I will. I will do so. Good to good to meet you virtually. Let me. I'll repeat the question here for you. It's where can and should Oklahoma be making smarter investments in our future success, and what are the best avenues to fund them? I, I think there uh, are several parts to that answer. Number one, um, with the deployment of high-speed internet throughout the state that's on our planning. I think we, we have to have that infrastructure in place and then we build out from there. Uh, I'm working, I've got an educational group which includes higher ed, VOTEC, K-12 and uh, corrections. And we're trying to get to the place to where we can deliver college courses, vocational courses, high school courses, like you would do Netflix, you know, click on the movie you want, pay the bill and go watch it. So I think that we ought to be able to boil down that to where we can get ourselves educated. There's 370,000 people in the state of Oklahoma that are short of a degree. So there's plenty of opportunity to raise our educational advancement just by recruiting those people back to education, but deliver it where they are instead of asking them to go someplace else. I think healthcare is another issue. Uh, a few years ago, when I was in the legislature, before we went to uh, work, work with the federal DHS and we looked at healthcare delivery systems, and one of the places we looked at was uh, Northern Alaska. And up there, they have clinics, and clinics dealt with 90 to 95% of the medical challenges. I think in Oklahoma, we could take that and deplore. And I understand there's a lot more federal health care systems that are popping up. We have a new one in Wewoka. I heard rumor of a new one in Seminole. But if we could get the uh, everybody taken care of at the local level with Medicaid expansion and keep them out of the emergency rooms, then we could balance out some of that. But uh, we also did, back years ago, um, uh, Full Motion Interactive Video between here 
And then we had a pathologist from the Health Sciences Center deal with a pathologist in Ada. And uh, they were talking about um, a woman that had breast, uh, possible breast cancer. And they went over the diagnosis with uh, doctor to doctor. And the pathologist here said, well, I would have recommended you not remove the breast because this is marbling. And, and then uh, and I would kept an eye on it. And the doctor at Ada said, well, I removed the breast. So I think there's a whole lot of things on medicine, education, healthcare, and, uh, and also employment opportunities. I have a uh, small wireless internet business and 2020 was my greatest year of growth because everybody went home to work. And so we just were inundated with, hey, help us out, we gotta work from home. And so I think if we can get broadband throughout the state, then we can tell people they can live in the country, they can drive to town and uh, have all the benefits of Oklahoma City, but not the uh, limitation of the traffic and just go when you want to go. So I think the, the, the role of government is incentives and under, underpinning this whole process. But we really need to look at mostly the private sector to deliver the services and in a partnership where it works for them, rural Oklahoma. Uh, and I think we have great challenges, but without a plan, I'm not sure that we make much progress. And so uh, that, that's probably what you're getting to here is what policies do we need to put in place to, uh, to provide greater excellence for Oklahoma and its people. That's, that's the idea. Thank you for that. Next, our next question, and we're gonna we're gonna hit Representative Hilbert first this time around. Uh, and I and I don't, uh, Representative Williams, you you missed the beginning of it after, or just to restate. So you know, each question will be directed towards someone, and then after that, I, I take the question on to everyone else. And the reason I'm or how I'm choosing the next people is who looks the most excited. So again, watch your. If you look real excited, I'm coming for you. If you look just real bored. You're, you're last in line. So, you know, oh, just watch, be careful how your space looks. Um, so let's, uh, Representative Hilbert, Oklahoma has been forced to declare a revenue failure six times in just over a decade. The state is fairly flush right now, but how can we best address the structural revenue issues that have triggered these revenue failures? I greatly appreciate that question because one of the things that you notice is, yes, that happened six times over the last decade, but you didn't see that happen over the past two years in the midst of a pandemic. And so uh, yourself, why, why did that not happen? And so uh, take a step back looking at our process and how it works is in February here in a few weeks, the Board of Equalization, which is a constitutional entity of statewide elected officials and um, you know, the Secretary of Agriculture, they will um, you know, vote on what the budget is, what they project the revenue will be for the state of Oklahoma for the ensuing fiscal year, the following July 1 through June 30. And based on whatever their projection is, the legislature can appropriate up to 95% of that projection. And what's happened historically is legislatures almost every year, they get to appropriate 95%. So what do they do? They appropriate the full 95%. Um, something that we've done um, over the past, a um, couple of budget cycles is instead of appropriating the full 95%, we've appropriated less than 95% and under appropriated based off of our authority, um, which, which has been a really good move. Obviously it worked through the pandemic. Um, so um, in February of 2020, we got an, a projection for what the budget was going to look like. And then of course, March of 2020, the Utah Jazz Oklahoma City Thunder game, the whole world changed um, uh, when Rudy Gobert tested positive for COVID here in Oklahoma City. Um, and, uh, and so then we started making budgets. And even though technically, constitutionally, we could still appropriate based off of that February appropriations authority that we were given, we received um, projections from the tax commission that for that fiscal year and the following fiscal year, we were looking at a $1.8 billion shortfall. And so we underappropriated. we used our rainy day funds and our savings accounts that the legislature or the governor had advocated for, and we were able to weather that storm. And so I hope that this is a practice that continues, of you know, making sure that we allow more wiggle room um, in our general revenue account um, to make sure that we don't have those shortfalls. Because as you know, a, a million dollar cut on July 1st is a million dollar cut. But if, if an agency gets a million dollar cut on January 1st, that $1 million cut is effectively $2 million because you're halfway through the fiscal year. 
And so the more that we can do to um, insulate ourselves from uh, the fluctuations of the economy, the better. And then secondly, not to take away everyone's talking points, but the other big piece to, to fixing this is to continue to diver diversify our economy. We're an oil and gas state. We have been for you know all of our history and we're gonna to continue to be for the foreseeable future. So not to run away from that, but to continue to diversify our economy because the more diverse we get, um, the more insulated we'll be from the ups and downs of the energy sector. Thank you. There we oh she Sarah Kirch got her hand up. That that registers as excitement to me. So I, I figured I'd just jump in because yeah, I, you I got it there. And you know, I'm very grateful um, that we didn't have to undergo um, uh, budget failures. The last couple of years when I was just beginning to run for office was were some of the most challenging budget years possible. And hearing the distress um, in our neighborhoods about um, wondering if their state was gonna get through. Um, was was really challenging. So I'm very glad we didn't have that failure. I think we do have to constantly balance the opportunity loss cost. So we are losing opportunities by not spending on people and on those needs that are there. I've even looked, you know, spent quite a bit of time looking at our deferred maintenance on our state assets. And that cost, all of us know when we have a major asset, it loses value and it and it costs a whole lot more if we wait. Um, to take care of things. So I am deeply concerned um, that we don't get so fearful about setting back funds that we're not spending those, those monies where they need to be spent um, for the opportunities. One thing that surprised me, and you know, I still always, even though I'm in the Capitol building, I still think, well, maybe this is happening and I just don't know about it because I know that there are folks in multiple agencies toiling away at, at, at budget and financial information. But um, what I haven't seen in our uh, present in our decision making in the legislature is a real understanding of the trends in our tax revenue. So that's looking at, you know, we'll talk a lot about sales tax exemptions or different kinds of income tax exemptions, um, corporate income, etc. But to look at how that's changed over time and what is impacting those trends and changes. If we're making decisions that cut taxes, or give away a credit or an exemption and forgo revenue for potentially 20, 30, 40 years, we really need to be analyzing that much data. Um, I also want us to do a better job of talking about population growth. I mean, the census is on my mind. We just went through redistricting 5.5% growth in our state's population. We should always be factoring that in. We're not gonna magically have fewer people facing some of the challenges that, that, that we're dealing with. Um, you know, we're, very least, we're going to see a 5.5% growth in some of those challenges. Um, we, we have to look at those longer trends. Um, I think there's a real speed sometimes with some of the um, tax or finance related measures that get rushed through where we don't really balance out all those costs. Um, absolutely, um, the lost opportunities should be considered. Paul, you, you've nodded your head one too many times, so you get the next enthusiastic uh, uh, slot. Yep. Senator Kurt is always going to beat me on the enthusiasm scale, I'm afraid, or I'm happy to say. Look at that. Yeah, um, going, I, you know, investing in people, which I think is ultimately what both Representative Hilbert and, and Senator Kurt are saying, um, makes absolute sense. Uh, how do you have a more balanced economy uh, than, than our dependence on oil and gas. You get people ready for any possible job and you build the infrastructure and the quality of life where every company in the world is paying us to come here rather than the other way around. Structurally though, as part of the question, um, the system that Representative Hilbert mentioned goes back to the 1980s after a couple of um, just dramatically horrible, uh, horrible revenue failures. And it's been a good system, um, but we have changed it in the past and I propose we need to change it again. When a revenue failure happens, it generally only applies to the five or six, only the five or six billion dollars of, of the state general fund. The state collects or could collect about 20 billion in taxes every year, but the only people that suffer are the, the education and health and other agencies funded by the general fund. Arguably, those are the key functions of state government, education, health, social services. We should find a way 
to amend the Constitution. I think we've done it three times on that provision since it was created. Everybody should take an equal share of the cut. Then a 5% cut for the general fund is not a 5% cut for the general fund. It's a percent and a quarter, it's 2%. And you would do that by, by reducing tax expenditures and incentives. You would do that by resenting so-called off the top money that goes directly to cities or counties or particular health agencies. And you would just say, hey, and you would even look wherever you could at um, minor reductions to tax credits or deductions that we all get and just say, hey, we're in this together. We all need to take a little hit. And that will that will you know get us out of the business of where we ever have to cut schools five or six percent in a single year. Quick, uh, just to, would that include what you're talking about? Would would that also include like ad valorem reimbursements for uh, counties as far as in in cutting that or? I'm not the guy in the room who gets to make the laws, but I would absolutely suggest that, um, you know, that that Google, uh, who is the largest beneficiary, probably could give up a percent, percent and a half, uh, if education can. Just just curious. Thank you. All right. Well, it's all, I'll tell you, between Representative Williams and Joe, you guys, I think, have got the best poker faces of the of the group here. We're going to we're, we're going to go with Representative Williams next. Do you want do you want me to repeat the question, sir, or do you? Yes, please. Okay, yeah, I was guessing, because by the time we go a few people through, you know, it's trying to remember what's the question to begin with. Uh, okay, our question is, Oklahoma has been forced to declare a revenue failure six times in just over a decade. The state is fairly flush right now, but how can we best address the structural revenue issues that have triggered these revenue failures? Well, I think when I was here before 88 through 94, we had, we started the rainy day fund and it was, I think, capped at $500 million. And now there's been some modification to that whole process. And I, Representative Hill, you could probably help out. We've got billions plus dollars in that, uh, in that account now, uh, which maybe have three different accounts. But I think that's one thing that we need to do is, you know, they always tell you if you're a, a family, you have six months of money in your account in case you lose your income, you can at least survive for a while and make some modification, maybe even survive for a year. I, I think we've made great strides in that, and I applaud uh, the leaders that have made those consistent movements upward. At the same time, I agree that we need to look to the future. You know, one of the things that I just, the reason I was late, I was at a hearing on the OCAST, Oklahoma Center for Advancement of Science and Technology, and the investments, we were talking about investments there. We need to figure out where we're going. Elect electric propulsion is going to be a big industry in Oklahoma. Uh, we're, we're looking at drones and, and the transportation system they bring, the potential. Uh, so there are so many things, but we need to look to the future, see where the world's going and see how Oklahoma fits that. And I would say that we probably aren't as aggressive about trends as we need to be. Um, I, I really think we really have to study where our world is going and the direction they're going and fit our future into that. And I think it's going to take maybe a little modification of the way we look to the future and uh, register what we could accomplish because you get to start changing the boat now, you can't take a huge destroyer and turn it around on a half a block. It's a very slow process of moving the needle. And we need to focus, we need to preserve the things that have been traditionally um, beneficial to Oklahoma, but we also need to look at the new opportunity and make sure that we balance our investment uh, for the future. Thank you. Joe, same question. A difficult task following those four, but I, I will do my best, Jeff. And I failed the first time to say uh, thank you to the Oklahoma Policy Institute for putting this together and allowing us to serve on this panel. I feel like I'm slightly unqualified with the distinguished panelists we have here. Um, I just would reiterate a couple of points uh, that other panelists have, have made. 
But I think uh, anytime you have a more diverse economy, uh, then you'll see more stability and, and uh, easier opportunities for budgeting. Uh, I can speak a little bit to some of the efforts that we've uh, provided or that we uh, put forth at the Chickasaw Nation. Uh, we, have, we have a department called Corporate Development where we look for opportunities uh, within the Chickasaw Nation and in Oklahoma to work with and partner with and invest in private companies in order to help diversify our portfolio. And I think a diverse economy, um, more diverse uh, economy in the state would lead to uh, more stability in the budgeting process. But thank you again for having us and thank you for moderating, Jeff. Yeah, well, and you talk about unqualified. I mean, that's no, you and I have felt unqualified for most of our lives. So that's no different thing here. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, next, next question, we'll go to Representative Williams first. And uh, before I go on that, I want to correct myself earlier, uh, Representative, before you before you joined in, I was going through bios and I said, and the, the, uh, the, the new kid on the legislative block because elected in 2020, well, you just said from 88 to 94. So that effect, I didn't realize that. So that makes you kind of the, the granddaddy of the, uh, of, of the panel, I think. Is that right? So let me correct myself there. Okay, um, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, next, next, next question is from and Representative Williams, from your perspective, what role should the government play in addressing the health and safety of its citizens? And what changes does Oklahoma need to make in its budgeting to reflect those roles? Well, that's a very complicated question because finding solutions in healthcare are probably one of the greatest challenges and the costs that are accelerating with uh, quality healthcare. You know, we spend a lot of money in this nation and in this state on health care, but our outcomes aren't as great as they are at different other places in the world. So what we you know, where do we correct that? Well, I think we have to, number one, if you're going to correct something, you got to know, know what your mistakes are. And I think we really need to comb through. Uh, a few years ago, when I was legislature before, Stan Hupfeld was the director of Integris Baptist Hospital out there. And I brought two or three of the guys together that were presidents of the large hospitals here in Oklahoma uh, City. I said, why don't we sit down and talk about specialization and let's decide who does what specialization so that when a person has a very difficult challenge in their life, they come to Oklahoma City for the solution because we have all the specialties in place that are focused. And Stan Hupfeld said, you know, that's probably a good idea, but I'm not sure we're ready to do that. So I think we're going to have to look at the changes and the modifications on quality health care and look at outcomes. We're, we're worse when it comes to smoking, overweight, a lot of different areas where we're bad, but I don't see any real initiative to say, let's change that. And I think it has to start in schools. I think we have to start with children and we have to fight the advertising. You know, this vape stuff has uh, just gone crazy. And our kids are participating. And, you know, even though it's, it's not legal, they're participating. So I think we really need to boil it down to, okay, what are our challenges? What are our fixes need to look like? And I think state government has a responsibility to provide incentives but we have to include our local communities because that's where the services are delivered. So I think it's a partnership, but assessment, planning, implementation are real critical. Thank you. And it sounds like uh, in a lot of what you mentioned there that the TSET would play a role in that too, as far as uh, the health outcomes. And that's a really good thing our, our state has. Um, let's see, looking around here. Representative Hilbert, you're right on my screen. You're right to the left of Representative Williams. I don't mean ideologically. I don't know about that, but you're right. You're right to the left here. And so I'm, I'm going to go with you next. Do I need to repeat the question or is it still? Oh, all good. All good. And, and, and Danny might say that, but I disagree. But um, uh, when, when we you look have at that it, debate between the two of you now, maybe that'll, I'll just cut. To, well, that's what we'll talk about next. Well, <laughs> um, when, when you look at health and safety, I mean, on health and, and Representative Williams hit on it, you know, uh, a, a big part of it, we talk about health care, but we all, we got to talk about health. 
itself. And, and we have, um, as a population, we have a lot of poverty. We have a lot of people that smoke and we have a lot of, uh, um, as a population that just doesn't exercise, you know, and, and those um, indicators that, that does not lead to good outcomes. And so, um, but on, on the safety piece of it, um, and I'm not sure if this was the intent of the, the question or not, but health and safety, um, we, we did something really big last year um, that there really hasn't been a whole lot of discussions about, but we passed public safety districts, um, allowing, which allows municipalities to um, tap into property tax resources um, as long as they get a 60% vote for, uh, for police, fire, um, EMS. And that's something that generations of legislators have been trying to get done, that Tulsa and Oklahoma City in particular have been trying to get done for decades and decades and decades and couldn't get it across the finish line. And that happened last year. And, and that was a, um, you know, a really big thing. And um, I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, as communities start to take advantage of that, of that program uh, for public safety within their boundaries. Let's see. Uh... Joe, what about, even though you're unqualified, Joe, what about, would you like to take the next stab at this? Uh, my mom would take offense to that, Jeff. So, <laughs> um, I, I, I think accessibility is, 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 is critical. Um, and I can look at the footprint, again, at, at what we've done under the leadership of Governor Anatoly at the Chickasaw Nation with our hospital and clinics strategically located where people have access accessibility to quality health care and the investments that the Chickasaw Nation has made to make sure that uh, our citizens have access to quality health care and health care professionals. Uh, one other thing I'd probably probably point out as a point of privilege too is I think partnerships are also extremely critical. Uh, when I look back at the pandemic and I consider um, some of what not just the Chickasaw Nation but other tribes did to help with uh, testing with COVID testing, with vaccinations, and some of the efforts that that uh, the tribal nations put forth to try to help uh, protect and, and help um, all Oklahomans, I, I think that that also is critical when considering health care. And um, again, good question. So, uh, Senator Kurt, would you like to go next? Yeah, I'm glad to. I, I want to focus just on one thing, which is substance use disorder and our state has incredibly high rates of substance use challenges. Um, we have high rates of addiction. We have high rates of overdoses. Um, and that is intertwined with safety. Um, so many uh, people in our criminal justice system have um, substance use disorder. Um, that is where our investments in helping folks get the treatment they need um, is going to make a big difference for all these other areas in terms of our family's well-being, um, et cetera. So I know at least a few years ago that a huge portion of those Oklahomans who were qualified for public health help with getting treatment could not get a bed. And we've been working very hard as state leaders to uh, increase the number of beds available for treatment. I know that we're in better shape now. But I know that still we do not have the resources needed to allow people to get the treatment they need. And it is so much cheaper to pay for outpatient treatment than it is for inpatient. Outpatient treatment, at least a few years ago, averaged about $3,000 a year. Inpatient, um, I don't even have the figures, um, but I know that it's very high, significantly more than getting people help they need before they lose their family, before they have challenges around um, criminal um, instances. We need to make sure that help happens early. And I think we have to stop looking at issues in isolation and we have to look at the interconnected challenges of them. Um, you know, they both include the urgency of, of the suffering of individuals. So um, I know sometimes when we get it deep into the numbers, it's easier to look at statistics. Um, but I think about each one of those people and the, the, the lost potential there for not only them, but their families. And the more that we learn about brain health and about trauma, it is absolutely part of our safety um, as a state that we improve our response and our resilience from trauma, that we work on early childhood. And that means the adults in the lives of the children. And we know that substance use is a huge way that folks try to cope with trauma. Um, so we have to look at those as intertwined issues and um, those budget investments make a difference on reducing suffering and reducing generational trauma. Makes sense. Paul. Yeah, I wonder, 
Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Appreciate the work you're doing here. Um, you're totally qualified for this. Uh, <laughs> I, I yeah, I'm the only one who has a job of the hut mug on this yeah. whole call, I bet. So yeah. Yep, I've got one from a university, and I'm not going to even involve the, the, get involved in that discussion. Um, I want to uh, piggyback on what Senator Kurt said. You know, the, um, we have been trailing in mental health services and substance abuse services for a long, long time. Um, and with some legislative help and with great leadership and federal money, our mental health department is really has made huge, huge gains. Um, if I don't know if I'm the only one sad enough to be watching budget hearings when I'm not paid for them, but I do that. And um, you know, this the links that the mental health department is making and is uh, making a difference on between poor mental health or substance abuse and homelessness and child abuse and child neglect. We know how to do this. Um, we are doing it. We just need to be able to do a lot more of it because there still are not enough. You know, we don't have the resources to diagnose and we don't have the resources for treatment. My answer to this question otherwise is always going to be whatever I've been reading lately. And I've been reading and hearing a lot about neighborhoods and poor health and poor safety and lack of safety are inextricably tie tied not only to the neighborhood you live, but the neighborhood you were born or grew up in. Um, I don't know what that means for the state other than it's something that the state, the tribes, the local governments and the private sector need to figure out how we can get uh, investments into the neighborhoods that need it most. That's where you find the people that Representative Hilbert is talking about and the people that Senator Kurt are talking about is in, you know, probably it's 100, 200 neighborhoods in all of Oklahoma and we could make a giant difference there. Um, there is great evidence for programs that do very minor improvements in neighborhoods, cut the grass and put the windows back in and cut gun crimes and property crimes by 50, 60%. So um, legislators, uh, I'm, I'm thinking if you can find ways to, to put some state uh, effort into whether it's research and development or grants to communities or grants to businesses, uh, that's an area where we could make a big, big difference that I don't think we've exploited enough. Thank you. Next question, go to Joe first. Uh, Joe, Oklahoma's economic development efforts are heavily focused on business incentives that mostly go to urban areas. I know that the Chickasaw Nation is doing innovative work in growing rural economic development. What are ways that Oklahoma can better involve and support rural Oklahomans in developing stronger economies for our rural communities? Thank you, Jeff. I um, probably partial, uh, but I, I would argue in rural areas that have a tribal footprint, uh, tribes oftentimes are a very strong economic engine uh, for those rural areas. But but kind of setting that aside, um, previous to working for the Chickasaw Nation, I actually worked as an economic developer in a couple rural areas, and uh, incentives are, are great to 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 finish a deal and make us more competitive. But I would also argue that before you get to the opportunity to apply as incentives to a possible deal, there are a couple of factors that can inhibit rural areas from being competitive. And I would say those two very briefly would be uh, workforce and infrastructure. And so one thing that I would point out is, let's say you've got a site locator uh, that is sent out an RFP and the site locator is looking for different communities to say, hey, you know, we're looking for a place to locate a business. And as you look at filling out an RFP, oftentimes you will have to meet the certain criteria for infra infrastructure requirements, or you're not even going to be considered. And what I mean by that is, does a community have proper or adequate water supply? Can you handle um, enough wastewater uh, for, for a business to, to relocate? Uh, what about rail? How far are you for, from a rail spur? And 
Um, do you have electrical capacity to meet the needs of a possible in, in industry prospect? Another one is connectivity, uh, broadband. As, as, as we look at a global marketplace, you know, businesses are not only competing with their neighbors in different cities, counties, or states. Uh, they're competing with people all over the world. And so if you don't have that high level of connectivity, if you don't have that capacity, then lots of times rural communities are at a disadvantage. And one thing I would say uh, as a point of emphasis that the Chickasaw Nation, under the leadership of Governor Anna Tubry, uh, several years ago, put forth uh, the idea and formed, formed uh, a business called Trace Fiber Networks. And so uh, that Trace Fiber has laid over, I, I believe, over 500 miles of fiber optic around the Chickasaw Nation. Um, I think if, if you look um, as a business trying to compete, especially for certain, certain sector jobs, technology sector jobs that are often high wages, uh, tremendous benefits, if you don't have that top level uh, connectivity, then you're not gonna be considered for it. Uh, and so one thing I would say is, I mentioned workforce previously, I don't mean to be long winded, I was short earlier, now you'll probably cut me off, Jeff, but uh, expanding uh, the rural broadband efforts also helps with the workforce side. Of it. And what I mean by that is you help our students in classrooms have the same technolo technological opportunities as the, at their fingertips as students who might be in downtown Dallas or in Chicago. And I know that everybody on this panel believes that our students are, are, are smart and, and have um, tremendous ability and opportunity to, to uh, as, as well as any students across the country. And so uh, that's an effort that we've put forth. And, and I will say uh, also thank you to the legislature. I know that you all have looked at ways to promote, enhance and study rural broadband uh, in order to allow for rural um, areas to be more competitive, uh, not only education wise, but economic development wise. And um, I'll also say that some of the work that Trace Fiber has done, we don't, we never do it alone. Uh, the Chickasaw Nation prides itself in partnerships and relationships. We look at, you know, whether it's OCAN, whether it's the Oklahoma Department of Transportation for right of ways, whether it's local county commissioners, city level leaders, uh, the state legislature. Uh, we are very uh, proud and, and uh, appreciative of the partnerships that we have at all levels of government. Um, I, I can, I'll give another example. Uh, under the leadership of Governor Anna Tubby, we, you know, he developed a National Resources Committee. And th what, what that uh, committee structure does is look for ways that, that we can help improve natural resources in communities across the Chickasaw Nation. So oftentimes, I'll give an example, uh, you know, Tishomingo will lend our internal expertise and resources even to help enhance maybe a wastewater project. And I know your question was about economic development, and I'll tie it back. You can't handle enough wastewater, you cannot recruit businesses. Not only that, you also can't go build homes to provide, to fill the gap for that workforce void that, that, that uh, is evident in rural areas as well. And so there are lots of ways, again, that, that we wanna help. And there's lots of ways that I think um, different levels of government can work together in cooperative partnerships to, to help all Oklahomans. Um, one final example I would say too would be um, when we talk infrastructure improvements, um, could be the tribal transportation program. When you look at dollars that flow down from the federal government to the state, and uh, we have an internal tribal transportation program where we want to work with communities, lay out plans where construction or uh, transportation infrastructure projects, you know, may not be able to be funded, but when you have partners at the county level, at the city level, at the tribal level, at ODOT, then you can see infrastructure in rural areas that is so necessary that we need to improve so much, you can see projects completed. And so I know that's a long answer, um, but I, I, I do want to emphasize uh, when you consider incentives, to your original question, when you consider incentives, urban versus rural, lots of times rural communities uh, can be uh, removed from the discussion before you even get to the incentive side of things. And uh, I, I uh, appreciate the question, Jeff. Appreciate the opportunity. I've decided you're qualified after all, Joe. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
next, I think, uh, e even though even though he still has his poker face on, we're, I'm going to go to Representative Williams next because you're you're rural like I am. You're the 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 non uh, we're we're non metro uh, residents here on this panel, and so the the question again is, um, how what are ways that Oklahoma can better involve and support rural Oklahomans in developing stronger economies for our rural communities? Well, one of the things that I think has to happen in the preliminary stages is we really need to look at specifics from communities and then broaden that to regions and then broaden that to the state. For example, uh, years ago, when Oklahoma passed its constitution, there was a constitutional provision that every train company had to serve every county seat. And over a period of time, some of that stuff got reduced, shut down, changed. Then the train companies wanted to come in and take it out of our constitution, which happened. Well, now we want to extend it from Oklahoma City. It's, it goes into Shawnee now. But there's a line that's been, uh, it's, it's not in use from there to Seminole to Wewoka, where we have a brick plant that could use that. And it extends all the way down to McAllister. One of the things that we're having to do is we're having to fight so hard with the train company people because they want to manage that asset in Oklahoma and they don't want to give up rights to use it someplace else, which might cost them something. For example, out of uh, McAllister, where they have the ammunition position there, when they're shipping things out of and if they had, if we had that line completed, they could just come from uh, McAllister to Oklahoma City. But they don't want, they don't want to, so we've been in discussions for six months. Uh, Senator Taylor, Zach Taylor, um, uh, Representative Del Curb, and I have all been involved in discussions and we're trying to make some progress, but it makes it very difficult when uh, you don't have a cooperative partner or they want to look at it strictly from their benefit not from the benefit of the state. Now, the other thing is we, we have to look at water and sewage treatment because uh, right now in Seminole, which is the largest town in my district, uh, there's nothing been done to their sewer plant of significance. I mean, that takes $20 million to fix it. Well, you can't go out and if uh, a company has a waste issue, uh, we can't really be in the competition to, to get that those facilities in here. And then finding a place in state or federal government to get $20 million is pretty tough. So, you know, how do you put it in? When you look at a bond issue, you look at all other things, but that local infrastructure has got to be there. And I'm sitting in the council today, just down the hall from uh, Representative Hilbert, uh, because we didn't take care of this building. It cost $130 million to fix it when it probably could have taken $30 million to maintain it. So uh, we, we have to be real careful in uh, preserving the infrastructure. I know that uh, I've got a map here of all of the uh, DOT projects that are going on in my district. And looking at that, uh, McLeod, we're trying to get a, a service road between the, the gaming facility there of Pottawatomie over to the cloud road where there's a loves. And so we can develop that on that side. We've got to have water uh, infrastructure brought down from McLeod to the interstate to provide that. So there are a lot of, I think we have to start, start at the local area and build out and also look from the state's entity all the way back down and say, okay, we need these assets. We need this opportunity. How can we help local people see what their goals are, what their needs are and try to plug it in. But I'm not sure how much that coordination is happening now. And I, I see a lot of individual efforts, but not, uh, not a great collaborative initiative. Thank you. And let me go next. And I'll, I'm, I'm looking at the time here because we've got a, a few other uh, questions and we want to get to audience questions. And so I'd ask, uh, I'll go to Senator Kurt next and then Representative Hilbert and uh, uh, to maybe have just brief, you know, brief, brief comments toward it. And then we can move on to the next question. Well, I want to talk about 
Um, something else tribes have done very well, and I think it intertwines with one of the biggest challenges, which is young people are leaving our rural areas. Um, you know, the census, it was shocking to me, um, the rapid um, departure of young people. And I know some of that is them not being able to stay because there's no jobs, but they're also not staying and creating businesses and creating those next opportunities. Tribes have invested in their artists and their culture. They have recognized the need to help people connect to each other, um, to have that uniqueness um, that only folks from that community can have. And I spent, you know, 20 years of my career traveling around meeting with artists all across the state and saw what amazing things our creative entrepreneurs do in communities, the kind of pride and connection that arts and culture can bring and mm -hmm. how that's not just like any other city across the country um, mm -hmm. when you invest in that local culture and local community. So uh, just want to bring up that example. Thank you. Good, good, good thoughts. Representative Hilbert. Yeah, I think we've, we've got to invest in our people in rural Oklahoma because, um, you know, if, if I'll use an example, President Trump, when she was at uh, OSU Center for Health Sciences, you know, she realized looking at our rural doc shortage, you know, how are we going to get doctors in rural Oklahoma? So a, a kid that grows up in Jinx, Oklahoma is not going to move to Guymon unless, you know, they happen to marry somebody that they meet a college that's from Guymon. I mean, even then they might not move from there. You know, my wife's from Panhandle. I don't live in Panhandle. Um, but I, I use that example, you know, if, if you're going to get doctors in rural Oklahoma, you need to have doctors that likely grew up in rural Oklahoma. And so what she did is she, she started younger and went through the FFA program and started finding kids, you know, in ninth, 10th, 11th grade that are in these communities and involved in FFA, successful students and saying, Hey, you go to OSU and, uh, you know, get your bachelor's degree and then come here. And they call it, you know, anyone that's seen the FFA, you've seen the blue blue jackets. If, if you never have, you know, um, it's, it's a wonderful thing. But she started the blue coat to white coat program to, to really target that. And I think that's a successful model and something that we've got to look at as well. Um, and, and letting students know of their career opportunities that they have, you know, in their local area. Um, it amazes me um, in Bristow, you know, we have multiple aerospace companies with very high paying jobs. And how many young people that live in Bristow don't realize, hey, you don't have to drive to Tulsa to work. You can actually get a job that pays better with just as good benefits without even leaving town. And so um, some of those things I think will be important with this. Thank you. Paul, do you, is there anything you'd like, I know the next question is going to you. Let me, is there anything you'd like to add to this one? Let me know. Yeah, let, we'll move on. let me just say really quickly that the state government needs to learn what the local, what our cities and counties and local businesses have learned. And that is learn from the tribes and cooperate with the tribes in their economic development effort. They are really good at this. Um, they have transformed and are transforming Oklahoma and rural and community areas, and we need to get on board that train. Thank you for that. But don't go too far because the next question goes straight to you, Dr. Shen. Oklahoma Policy Institute has consistently noted that most of the work on the state's annual budget occurs outside the public view and even excludes many lawmakers. This past year, there were three days between the introduction of the budget bills to their approval during the last week of session. How can we improve transparency so that everyday Oklahomans can be more deeply engaged in the state budget process and spending of their taxpayer dollars? Thanks for that question. And let me, let me just start with why, why, the, why that matters. Um, the constitution makes us a republic. Uh, we, we elect people who we believe will fairly represent and effectively represent our views of the state capital and the national capital. Um, once that happens, the model only works if at re-election time we can hold those people accountable. It's pretty hard to do that right now from a budget perspective. And the budget is the only thing that constitutionally the legislature is required to do besides the every 10 year redistricting. Um, and yet we can't tell in any meaningful way what our individual representatives and senators, what their beliefs are on the budget. It's a single budget bill, there's no amendments, uh, and there isn't even time uh, to read through the budget before it's adopted. And, and similarly, there isn't time really for me to have a conversation with, uh, with my senator or representative about 
here's what I think you should be funding that you're not. Now, so let me go from that to um, really uh, an uncharacteristically, uncharacteristically positive statement about the legislature. And that is <laughs> that, is that um, this year for the first time, I believe since 2005, the budget committees are having hearings on the budget request of every agency. Uh, and that here's why that matters. Um, if you have uh, a dis, uh, if you have a revenue figure from the Board of Equalization, like Representative Hilbert explained, your discussion is purely about how much money do we have. And we all know how that discussion comes out. If there's a little more money, we give half of it to K through 12 and we dribble around, dr dribble it around for a few things. We're not having the, the whole discussion though. Just the discussion needs to be what needs do we have, not just what money do we have. Um, what can we do? Um, how much money would it take, as we all were, learned yesterday, if we watched those hearings, um, to eliminate the, dis the waiting list for developmentally disabled adults? And then I can ask you, now that I know that number, why aren't you voting for that? So um, Ms. Morris really hit the high points of the study that she and I did. Uh, and here's what I'd say to the last half of the question, and I'll, I hope, give you a little time for other things. Um, it's probably a good idea to put transparency into the law, but we actually don't need to do that. The legislature and the governor have the power to make the budget more transparent. You've used that power for hearings uh, this year, I, and I would say, keep it up. Um, nothing prevents the governor or the legislature from publishing those the but agent budget agency budget requests so Oklahomans can figure out, you know, what could we do? to reduce substance abuse? What would it cost? And how does that compare to some other priorities? Um, in our study, two thirds of the states publish those. The legislature can open up the budget process by putting the budget on the same schedule as the rest of the, uh, as legislation. You know, give the appropriations committee three weeks to come up with a budget and run it through the house, run it through the Senate, the way that most states do and the way that we manage to do with all the less important legislation. And the legislature also can and really, you know, uh, ought to make itself subject to the, the state's open meeting act that, that applies to virtually every other state agency. Thank you, Paul. And I'm, I'm looking at the time here and we've got a little less than, um, uh, well, a little less than 15 minutes left. Uh, I'm thinking what I'll what I'll do here. I know it's only natural that we we got it. We should ask this question of the uh, the vice chair of the A and B committee here. So, Representative Hilbert's on deck. But then and then what I would say is after that, who I there you go. I Senator enthusiasm. I see it. Uh, and then after after Representative Hilbert, Senator Kurt, and then between Representative Williams and Joe, whoever wants to come in after that, then what I'd like to do is try to get some audience questions. Uh, real quick, but Representative Hilbert's question again is um, uh, how can we improve transparency so that everyday Oklahomans can be more deeply engaged in the state budget process and spending of their taxpayer dollars? Absolutely, and and certainly we can continue to improve every year. Uh, I, I disagree with the entire premise of the question. Um, uh, Mr. Shin and I have had this conversation privately uh, before and publicly, but um, you know, we've we it is in the fall, agencies submit their budgets um, to the legislature that they propose. And then in the spring, it wasn't just this year, previous years as well, the House, at least, I can't speak for the Senate, our subcommittees hold public hearings with every agency's budget request to hear what they, what they pr propose. And so the process is a public process of how it comes up. And so when the bill ends up being in a, when the budget ends up being in a bill form, um, that is the final stage of the process, but there are a lot of inputs um, leading up to the budget well before it reaches that stage. And I'll just say uh, a plug here for my chairman, Kevin Wallace, the work that he has done over the past five years, over the past few years as chairman of the House Appropriations Committee has made great strides in improving this um, where, um, you know, if you look back and, and I don't want to get partisan and get into that because it's a good discussion, but if you look back under previous um, times, uh, previous administrations, um, the budget would get unveiled on the day of, and the lawmakers didn't even know it was in it, and they were voting on it before they even knew it was happening. I mean, even my first year in the legislature, we had a situation where the budget bill was dropped at around 11.50 p.m. and had to be voted on before midnight because it had to happen within that legislative day. 
But in the past few years, uh, Kevin Wallace has said, you know, we're not going to do that. The budget's going to get dropped ahead of time. Lawmakers are going to get an opportunity to do that. And, and Chairman Wallace and I personally have went to the minority caucus each of these years um, and went through the budget and answered any questions that they have. Um, and a lot of times there, there aren't a whole lot of questions because we've had this long, lengthy process of all the budget hearings. And, and I'll say, you know, sometimes these budget hearings, um, some are better attended than others. Um, you look at the State Department of Education budget hearing we held on the House floor yesterday. There are a lot of members there. There are a lot of people tuning in. People get real excited about SDE, rightfully so. It's a lot of money. But you look at some of the hearings the day before, the Oklahoma Health Care Authority budget, um, also a lot of money, but it's Medicaid, it's complicated. Nobody was really paying attention. There wasn't a lot of legislators present. And so, um, you know, I, I think sometimes, you know, if, if you want more input, absolutely. We can continue to improve, want to continue to improve. Um, but if you hear something in that budget hearing that you want to see get across the finish line, reach out to your legislators because each individual legislator has an input on the budget. Senator Kurt, I think you wanted to jump in real quick. Yeah, that'd be great. So um, I think first, I just want to say that that no criticism of the process is personal. And I think that's an ongoing challenge that I have. I have so much respect for Representative Hilbert and all my colleagues who serve in leadership of the budget. I think that they've inherited a system that puts all the weight on them. Um, our budget chairman and vice chairman are pretty much the only people other than staff that have a fluency with the budget to understand uh, the moving parts, the challenges. Um, sometimes I think they're they're kind of like the treasurer in a little nonprofit organization where they're the only ones who really know what's happening. Um, but that's not fair um, in terms of all the rest of us should have responsibility as well. So um, sometimes I would say my uh, I think Senator Thompson would agree um, when I ask him to see parts of the budget, he thinks that it's a partisan question that I as a minority party member want to be able to see the budget. But what I really want is the public to be able to see those processes. And I think the structure we have now encourages us um, to view efficiency in terms of being able to move things through um, for the lack of public participation. And um, I know it would be hard. It'd be incredibly difficult. Each member in the legislature would have to get more informed in order to truly answer the justification for the budget decisions being made. But I think that would be a very healthy and meaningful thing for the public's um, trust in us, uh, the public's understanding of why we need tax revenue, as well as reducing the burden on just a few individuals doing heroic work on the budget when really it should be a shared accountability and shared work. Thank you. I feel like we probably covered this pretty this question pretty good, unless there's disagreement from Joe or Representative Williams. Um, it would, with that, with that being the case, in the interest of time, let me move on. We're going to have a few audience questions here real quick. And I think what I'm going to do is just so we can get through a few, I'll just direct them at, you know, one, one person and they can answer and can move on. And uh, Representative Williams, I know we talked about this a little bit earlier in it, um, but I'll address this to Senator Kurt from the audience question again. And it says, broadband is critical for those working from home. Is Oklahoma taking full advantage of federal grants to grow stable broadband, or what are measures we can take to ensure greater broadband access statewide? No, I'm not sitting in those uh, decisions, but I think the American Rescue Plan and the National Infrastructure Package are going to be a huge opportunity. We've been behind the curve on planning, and so that's been hard for us to put the money to work, but our, we have a good leadership now working to make that happen. So uh, and someone else may have a more up-close version, but I feel like we finally have um, some some of those steps moving to put those federal dollars to work. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joe, would you like, yeah, I see your hand up, go for it. I was just gonna, this specific question, the, the Chickasaw Nation has actually applied for a couple of grants, including federal dollars for, from the Tribal Broadband Connectivity Grant through the US Department of Commerce. And then also uh, we have, or prepared a submission for uh, ARPA funds as well. Um, so just going to note that from, from, from our end, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, next question I'll pose to Representative Hilbert. Again, it's an audience question. And they say, Oklahoma's population is getting older, moving past pandemic-related funding, and with consideration to the growing demand for aging services, do you see a path forward for sustainable funding that will allow the growing population of older Oklahomans to age in place 
keeping them out of a nursing facility for as long as possible? Uh, yeah, I appreciate that question. And I think there's some innovative things that um, I've seen some other states do uh, in terms of Medicaid dollars, where they get a Medicaid waiver um, for um, allowing individuals to have make a home handicap accessible and provide different uh, construction work within the home so that somebody uh, that is aging can stay within their house, have a better better care, and also not be in a nursing home, win-win all around. Um, that's some, something that I've seen done in other states. Um, I think in terms of nursing homes themselves, we have a real crisis that we've got to talk about. And uh, Senator Kurt and I will be in a meeting this afternoon where we'll be talking about that. But um, digging into making sure we have the workforce that's necessary to work in the nursing homes, because right now they are in a real crisis mode. Um, and, and we've got to make sure that um, we can provide that as well um, as, you know, the other essential services. Thank you. Um, and what we'll do here, and I'm just, I'm going to throw this out and the most enthusiastic person will answer it versus directing it someone and we'll just, whoever wants to take it. Uh, another audience question, what are the panelists thoughts on establishing a living wage? Also, and when legislators review the jobs picture, do they know what percent are living wage jobs? Yeah, I'll give that a shot. Um, we uh, continue to have, I think, tied for about 20th, the lowest minimum wage uh, in the country. Uh, other uh, states and localities are increasing the minimum wage. Uh, we really need to look at that. We're hurting ourselves. We're hurting our businesses. Uh, there's a huge difference between a minimum wage and a living wage, and I want I, I appreciate the question because you know the the living wage per se a a, a a parent with a couple of kids even in rural Oklahoma is uh, nineteen twenty dollars an hour. So there, it's not just I mean this this in my opinion is a time for some regulation and and expecting the private sector to to step up to some of its responsibilities. At the same time, it's a joint private and public responsibility to create the education and the support system that makes every Oklahoman worth $22 an hour. And, and we have a ways to go there as well. Thank you. One, one other audience question here, uh, and I'm just gonna throw this out again. Um, how can a community schools model improve the accessibility issues to health, mental health, and social services? How can the legislature assist in pulling together these various agencies to improve accessibility? Um, I can speak to that just because I know of the, an example school in Oklahoma City Public Schools that worked on this and several um, partnerships between the school district and DHS are returning some of our social workers and DHS workers to the schools. We've recognized that that's where the kids are. That's where the families are coming and they need those supports there. Um, I know that DHS, the Department of Human Services is working on um, some more um, opportunities in community schools. So I think if you're interested in that, I would connect with the Department of Human Services and try to be a part of their uh, working group going forward. Okay. Um, you know, I, we've got three minutes left. I want to just real quick and, and whoever can answer this, they want to, but this goes out to everybody. And that is, it is a final question. If you could make one change uh, to the state's budget and revenue system, what would it be and why? If, you, if there's just something burning on your mind that you want to talk about for a moment, anyone here? Well, I, I'd like to point out something, you know, we talk about our constitution and state question 640 comes up all the time and talks about revenue and tax. But I think there's another portion of the constitution that's important to talk about. I think if you ask Oklahomans, Democrats, Republicans, independents, should we overhaul our tax system, make it more simple? You, you would get a very high polling, right? Most people agree with that. Um, but if you wanted to do it, the, the issue is the single subject clause of our, our constitution it makes it very impossible. Now, there is an exemption to the single subject clause, and that's if you have a revenue raising measure that's state question 640. Um, but to get 75% on an overhaul would be very challenging. So what would, you would have to do is have a series of bills that lower taxes in some areas, say the grocery tax, and then you'd have another series of bills that raise taxes. And everybody would vote for the tax cuts, but no one would want to vote for the tax increases, even though the, the net effect for the average Oklahoman would probably be flat in any model like that. Uh, the single subject clause makes that very challenging. I'm, I'm not advocating to do away with the single subject clause. I think that's a good thing we have in Oklahoma government. 
Um, but it is a unique challenge that we have in addressing um, any major tax reform. Anybody else like to throw? Area of Representative Williams, sir. I just want to congratulate Representative Helbert and uh, Chairman Wallace for the great job they've done in appropriations and budget uh, for the House. And of course, that spreads on, on the Senate and the governor. They have done the best job I've ever seen of isolating monies, explaining them where they go, what their goal is, and what we need to accomplish. And uh, each year, and we have a caucus, and, and they make a presentation in that caucus, and they give us, us many opportunities to, uh, to talk to them about it in, in a private setting. Now we're going, I've been in hearings this week for three or four days on the educational budget. And uh, just like I said, it just came off an OCAST meeting and OETA and many others, but those are open to the public. I will tell you though, that there's no public attending. And what you see is you see some of us, members of the legislature, you see staff of the agencies, but you don't really see a plug-in for people that just really want to know how things work. And I think there's a certain disconnect among our people because I think they just feel like, well, I'll never be able to get that. We need to look at a way to where we can make what we do a little more plausible, a little more visible, and a little more capable to them in, the single, uh, in really simple terms. But I want to go back to what I said to open my remarks. Representative Helbert, Representative Wallace are excellent at explaining how the expenditures of money that are being proposed are going to be, be uh, implemented. And we just need to find a way to get that out to everybody that's interested in uh, what, uh, so they can have their own comments. Thank you. Excellent. And Senator Kurt, I see, did you want to say something real quick? And then I think we'll be at time and. Yeah, well, I, I'll end on a thematic note, which is I just, um, if I saw one thing, it would for us to be brave and to trust uh, our judgment um, by being well-informed. So those long-term trends, really knowing that information, um, the state revenue is not going to dry up to zero overnight. Um, and I think we sometimes make knee-jerk reactions because we're concerned about shifts. We need to understand the long-term trends and then be brave in serving people and really addressing the mountain of need that's in front of us now and how that can turn into amazing opportunities for more Oklahomans. So I just being brave. Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you all. I've enjoyed this, I hope you have too. We've tried to have kind of a nice relaxing discussion all in our own offices and hopefully next year we can, we can kind of all do this in person. But thank you all for your time and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. On awake, I think that means I turn it back over to you. That's right, thank you. Thank you Absolutely. to our panelists. And thank you, Jeff, for moderating today's event. Um, one of the challenges of doing events virtually is that you don't get the standing applause. And um, if, if everyone can see the Slack channel, you would be our Slack channel at OK Policy, you would know that there is a standing ovation taking place for a lot of the answers from the panelists. And it has definitely created a conversation and debate in our chat on Zoom. So thank you all for really raising and lifting and elevating um, and trying to make right things that are really complicated in a simple to understand way that all Oklahomans can relate to. I also wanna take a minute to recognize my board members that are present today because right, I am an ED of a nonprofit and they are my bosses, but I just wanna recognize that our chair, Joe Sayano, Beverly Carmichael and Susan Bynum are on listening to us today and thank you, as well as one of our former chairs, Ann Claire Duncan. Thank you all for taking the time out of your day to be with us. It means quite a lot to the staff um, that you're present. So we're going to take a really short break and reconvene at 11.35 to hear our keynote speakers. So um, put yourself on mute and get up, take a stretch, and we'll see you back here in about 10 minutes. Thank you all. CEO, welcome back. I am so excited to introduce our keynote speaker for today, Angie Cooper. No stranger to our state, Ms. Cooper is originally from Oklahoma and she's a graduate from Oklahoma State University. In her current role, she leads Heartland Summit and Heartland Forward's programming efforts. 
For those who aren't familiar, the Heartland Summit is the flagship convening of Heartland Forward, a Bentonville, Arkansas-based think and do tank focused on advancing economic performance and opportunity in the center of the country. As Chief Program Officer, Ms. Cooper is focused on turning Heartland Forward's research into action, creating a new partnership, leading on policy solutions, and serving as a resource for Heartland communities. Before joining Heartland, Ms. Cooper worked for more than 16 years in international and domestic public policy and government affairs for Walmart Stores, Inc., most recently as Senior Director of Global Public Policy. Her previous experience with the company included working in various departments, including merchandising, public affairs, state and local government relations, and the Walmart Foundation. While at Walmart, she served as Walmart's chair of the Women's Resource Council, a group of women and men who cultivate an inclusive environment and act as a forum to connect, develop, and advocate for their members. It's my honor to welcome Angie Cooper. Good morning. My upbringing in Oklahoma is part of the reason why I wanted to join an organization like Heartland Forward and why I'm extremely honored to be with you today. At Heartland Forward, our mission is to improve economic performance in the heartland and to help change the narrative of the country. Our people, culture, industry, and local economies are the beating heart of the United States. It's such a pleasure to be with you today and thank you so much for the introduction. And while we are not meeting in person as expected, I know we all remain dedicated to advancing Oklahoma forward. My name is Angie Cooper and as mentioned earlier, I am the Chief Program Officer at Heartland Forward. And I am also a very, very proud Oklahoman. I grew up in Enid, went to Oklahoma State and started my career in the Capitol representing Walmart where I believe I worked with many of you on policy initiatives to help improve the Oklahoma economy and, and even dedicating a portrait in the Oklahoma capital of what some might call the most talented entrepreneur from Oklahoma in our history, Sam Walton. Remembering the days of walking the halls in the Oklahoma State Capitol early in my career leads me to why I made the decision to go from leading global public policy for the largest company in the US outside of the government to now working for Heartland Forward. We are a nonpartisan public 501c3 calling ourselves a think and do tank, lifting up Heartland economies in the 20 states that we call the center of our country. It's been exciting to work for a startup founded in 2019 with 14 employees and growing. As I think, as I think and do tank though, we work to be a resource for communities with a focus on four pillars. Those four pillars include innovation and entrepreneurship, human capital and workforce development, health and wellness and regional competitiveness all with the mission on our programmatic activity, puts our research into action and our programs drive future research. And believe me, there's so much to study and do right here in the heartland. So consider this, the heartland produces 6 trillion in GDP, which is roughly 30% of the total US economic output. This makes America's heartland equivalent to the third largest economy in the world behind only the US, China, larger than the national economies of Japan, Germany, and the United Kingdom. This sounds like a pretty amazing heartland, but why is there still a great opportunity to tell the story of the heartland? Ensuring that everyone understands the impact we can have on the US economy and around the world. When I talk to people outside of Oklahoma, let's just say those on the coast, I share my story. I share that I grew up in what's referred to as Middle America, a small town in Oklahoma called Enid. I tell them Enid is in Northwestern Oklahoma, about an hour and a half from Oklahoma City, not quite to the Oklahoma Panhandle. 
Some still are not certain which panhandle I am referring to, Oklahoma, Florida. And let me tell you, they hardly assume it's the one in Oklahoma. Through telling my story, I often begin to tell the history. Yes, I believe understanding the history of the heartland is still important in this fast paced world of social media, tech, crypto, NFTs, and the list goes on for some things I don't want you to test me on what they really are. So the history. In Enid, in around 1910, the town's population was about 5,000. When I was growing up there in the 1980s, the population had grown up to 80,000, making it one of the largest towns in Oklahoma. By 2010, though, the population dropped almost to half. That means the town grew by more than a thousand people a year for 70 years. Then in less than half that time, the population was cut in half. We know this is the case for many Heartland communities. Now, I love Enid. My dad was mayor when I was growing up and those of you in this virtual event with me that live there are from work or travel there, we all know Enid remains a vibrant community. That is because leaders embrace their assets, Vance Air Force Base, farming and wheat, manufacturing, promoting civic engagement, people that care about Enid and leveraging things they know will make Enid successful for years to come. The question still remains though for many states and communities. Our hope is that the work of Heartland Forward inspires dialogue and action to secure a bright economic future for hardworking Americans across the entire country. There are amazing stories and advancement in the heartland that we must share. I'm a strong believer and we can't lose sight or ignore, as I always like to say, the middle of the country needs the coast as much as the coast needs the middle of the country. These are all things we know and understand. So what are our few things Heartland Forward has initiated to ensure that states like Oklahoma and communities like Enid continue to boost our economy? First, rethinking and sometimes even modernizing economic development is a must. Why is this important to us? Entrepreneurship is crucial opportunity that creates jobs, sustains local economies, and advances society forward. This is the very foundation of the American dream. But what's more is we are missing out on this important opportunity because America is largely failing its entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurial activity is in a decades long decline. Hopefully the change nature of how we work due to the pandemic will give entrepreneurship a much needed rebound. But we are at risk of not ca capitalizing on this potential. The first thing we get wrong is the barriers we put in place to entrepreneurship. Let's face it, becoming an entrepreneur is increasingly out of reach for most, precisely because of the opportunity gap. It's risky for most because it means quitting a job, not taking a salary, missing student loan payments, or going without health insurance. And options for funding a startup and a new business are scarce, especially if you're a woman or a person of color, or if you're one of the 99% of startups that will never raise a penny of venture capital. We believe that buildership at Heartland Forward is how we democratize opportunity and revitalize the American economy, especially in the heartland, because buildership rightly associates, associates entrepreneurship with the seeding of any idea, not necessarily finding the next big Silicon Valley unicorn, but buildership is about investing in community and community solutions. This is why over the past year and a half, Heartland Forward has partnered with builders and backers in Accenture to take a new approach to problem solving that is community driven and focused on driving people and giving them the tools to bring their entrepreneurial ideas to action across the heartland. To do this, we have created what we call the Community Growth Program and Toolkit that specifically focuses on seeding ideas in the heartland. 
I believe that anyone can generate creative solutions through entrepreneurial experimentation. That contributes to the sustainability of communities and makes them thrive. That means everyday businesses are creating jobs. Entrepreneurs are building opportunities and solving problems. I've experienced firsthand the incredible ingenuity and entrepreneurial spirit embedded in the heartland. Here's a short video to give you a taste of how this works. There are so many great things going on in the heartland today and, and more people need to know about it. We have incredible entrepreneurs. We have incredible small businesses. We have people that really care about building their community. The mission of Heartland Forward really is all about how do we help change the narrative about the middle of the country and kickstart economic growth. We define the Heartland as 20 states, everything from North Dakota down to Texas, over to Alabama, up to Michigan, Ohio, and all the states in between. We're trying to identify common issues like investing in human capital, supporting entrepreneurship, as well as health and well-being that will help the center of the country, the heartland, achieve stronger economic growth in the future. We call Heartland Forward a think and do tank. A think and do tank does not want to create research that sits on a shelf. Uh, we want it to be out there in the real world. We are making sure that the research is driving the programs, and then the programs are driving research. We have launched a very exciting program called the Community Growth Program and Toolkit. We have partnered with Accenture, which is bringing their digital skills to the table to build out the toolkit. And Builders and Backers, which is a world-class organization led by Donna Harris. A lot of people think about entrepreneurship as just start a business way to make money. But if you think about the power of entrepreneurial thinking and doing, it's really a way to solve problems. And that's really what we're trying to do with Builders and Backers. They don't have to quit their job. They can go through our program and they can test their idea with the Pebble Grant funding, and then they can grow. Heartland Forward chose Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Oxford, Mississippi for our inaugural program. What we saw was that our program can really help elevate what was already happening in these two communities. What's really inspiring about these builders is their passion, their stories. They come from these communities. They care about them. They want to have an impact. I believe that education is a right and that everybody should have access to one that is meaningful to them. I believe in this community and they are good people. And that's what I believe the difference is, is the heart and the people. Well, thank you for coming out. It's good to see you. I'm so proud. Everybody came together, and to me, that, that, that means the world. With the success of what we've seen in Tulsa and Oxford, and with the great partnership of Builders and Backers and Accenture, we are making a commitment that we're going to add a thousand new builders within two years. When you look at Heartland entrepreneurs, when you look at the small businesses that make up the Heartland, that's really what drives the American economy. This cohort-based program combines a 45-day builder idea accelerator to teach participants how to put ideas into action followed by 45 days of actively executing their ideas through a single experiment. All of the builders are actively working and doing some pretty amazing things. They're supported by a $5,000 Pebble Grant to test their ideas and participants are mentored by master builders throughout the program because we believe that creating a solid network of lasting support is key to entrepreneurship. We also expose builderships to the concepts of builders of storytelling. We believe that storytelling through video written stories and social media and media partnerships, the program inspires people to become builders. Working with local partners, we chose 
to launch our first ever cohort in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In Tulsa, we, um, we launched about 10 builders and then we have made the decision to double our commitment in Tulsa and are serving 20 builders that we now are going to make a difference for the state. We also are expanding our footprint in the state by launching a brand new cohort in Oklahoma City this year. For the second year in a row, the cohort is a majority of, of, majority of color and majority of women. I find this so revealing. Again, the cohort is majority people of color and majority of women. I find this revealing. Clearly, there's something within our current job market that is not speaking to how women and people of color want to work, such to the point that they want to abandon their jobs and invest in their own entrepreneurial pursuits. More than this, it speaks to the great need to offer these opportunities because when they are offered, so many who are traditionally left behind raise their hand and jump to participate. I find this aspect of the program amongst one of the most encouraging. I had the opportunity to meet some of our new builders last week, and they are really incredible. Some of their ideas include a mobile barber service, an AI powered platform to connect people with adoptable pets, an app for nursing students to help pass medication or medication administration exams, a digital platform for athletes and local businesses to connect for sponsor opportunities, and a website connecting readers to books about or by people of African descent. There is so much hope for our future with them at the helm, and I'm really excited to see how these ideas will transform into reality and that can impact so many lives. So we are excited about the Community Growth Program and Toolkit and its potential to create real change in our communities. We have committed to supporting a thousand builders across the heartland by 2023. But we know there is much more that policymakers can do to inspire entrepreneurship. Alongside a recent report put out by Heartland Forward entitled America's Entrepreneurial States, our economists created a first of its kind tool that allows users to see how their state compares to other states in terms of entrepreneurship and how improving certain areas would be expected to improve their state's ranking. Through this tool, you can go to our website, heartlandforward.org, and explore what Oklahoma can do to adjust to improve the entrepreneurship ranking in the state. Improving things like percent of households with computers in the home, a degree in higher education, and access to capital investments for young firms are all areas in which Heartland Forward data shows will increase Heartland states to be considered more advanced. It's obvious that New York, California, Massachusetts are at the top of the list, but we shouldn't be surprised that states like Minnesota, Texas, and Illinois, Heartland states, are moving up on the list. We know in policy and economics, growing on entrepreneurship is not a one size fits all approach. The toolkit you will find on our website is a guide to determine what is best for the state of Oklahoma. Other policy solutions. For example, we know that access to high speed internet, even not having a computer in the household can be a major barrier for starting a business and bringing your idea to life. There should be more government grants available and more money spent in terms of business R&D that all contribute to a thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem. Especially coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic, it is crucial communities think strategically about how to cultivate this ecosystem and make it easier, not harder, for entrepreneurs to start and develop their businesses. 
So why make the decision to focus on these initiatives? It's exciting to see that Oklahoma is doing it now. As soon as, and soon, very, very soon, we will have some more stories from Heartland Forward and videos from builders in Tulsa and Oklahoma cities to share their success stories across the Heartland. And as I mentioned earlier, among the most important pieces of faci facilitating innovation and economic development is access to reliable high-speed internet. I know the state and many communities are leading efforts on this issue. At Heartland Forward, we have created the Connecting the Heartland campaign that is focused on ensuring American families in the Heartland have the high-speed affordable internet access necessary for participation, for full participation in life in this very digital age. Fortunately, there is tremendous opportunity on this front. The historic passage of the Federal Infrastructure Bill includes a $65 billion investment for states and localities to expand access to high-speed internet. The largest portion of this money, about 43 billion, will be distributed by the NTIA to fund connectivity programs like broadband equity access and deployment programs and digital equity grant planning program. The second largest chunk though, around 14 billion, will allow the FCC to continue the emergency broadband benefit, which provides discounts for folks on their internet bills and devices. The new extended plan of EBB is called the Affordable Connectivity Program. It will be a permanent fund to help people access affordable internet. We are currently in the implementation stage on all of these federal dollars. And, and the, the big issue is how do we get them out the door? And if you're like me, you're probably trying to figure out exactly how much money the state of Oklahoma will get. I can tell you every state starts with at least $100 million for expanding access through competitive grant opportunities that will come down from the NTIA and other agencies. Let me say it again, $65 billion, the historic passage of federal dollars through the passage of the infrastructure bill. This funding has the potential to make a real impact in closing the digital divide. That being said, this will not work if these dollars are spent in a way that provides those who need it most, the unserved and underserved. So we must get this right. That is why Heartland Forward created four guiding principles to maximize the impact of federal spending on connectivity and informing policymakers to put these funds to their equitable and sustainable use. First, public investment in high-speed internet should lift everyone up. That means addressing barriers to access, affordability, and adoption. Second, communities should drive solutions that meet their own unique needs. To do so, many communities, especially smaller ones, with limited staff and expertise, need technical assistance, planning, support, and authority to determine what's in their best interests. And third, regulations and standards should maximize investments for long-term impact. But let me go back to what I said earlier. These aren't one-size-fits-all solutions. As a policy think-and-do tank and the person helping to lead the do, this is a roll up your sleeves, boots on the ground kind of approach. I like to quote my partner and friend at Lando Lakes. This is dirt under your fingernails type of work. As Oklahomans, we get that. We know having access to high-speed internet is crucial because high-speed internet access will have a positive impact across our economy, especially at the local level. Not having high-speed internet impacts how you search for a job, do a job, train for a job. It impacts telehealth and health innovation, quality education, and future job creation. We must create equitable plans for communities and help our states, cities, and towns prepare for this massive amount of federal funding that will be received. 
When we think about the two items I just talked about, this is all tied together by our goal to create a society that enables economic mobility and reduced inequities. In Heartland Forward's report entitled, Does Geography Determine Destiny? We reviewed data that follows 20 Americans from childhood to adulthood, allowing us to trace their outcomes and connect them back to the countries, neighborhoods, where, from the countries and the neighborhoods where they grew up. Using this rich data set, we were able to map how geography impacts a person's access to opportunity how a family's zip code can determine a child's economic future. And while unsurprising, these results are sobering. There is much work to be done. Heartland Forward remains committed to achieving a better understanding of how to drive inclusive economic growth in the heartland, including growth that generates a more equitable opportunity for low income communities and communities of color. But this requires flexibility and a cohesive approach to generating economic opportunities for communities, especially those that have been historically left behind. Work has shifted, something that Oklahoma knows well. That is why Tulsa Remote has become one of the most successful programs in the country by recognizing the change trends in the workforce and quickly acting upon it. Tulsa is leading the way on creating lasting opportunities for the city and its communities. Whether it's creating accelerator programs that give entrepreneurs the funds and resources to pursue their dreams or investing high-speed internet access and digital infrastructure, Policymakers need the tools to help us realize a better world than the one we had before. We believe strongly that every single person, regardless of their race, gender, or hometown, deserves access to economic opportunity, labor force training and education and healthcare resources. We have a lot of work to do to get there. We look forward to continued collaboration with diverse community partners across the country to find actionable solutions that can bring about the changes we must make that our country and our Heartland can do better. Well, I talked about entrepreneurship earlier. Heartland, focus, Heartland Forward has focused on what reshoring means to Heartland communities. America must invest in reshoring its own industries to reduce our reliance on the manufacturing of products in other countries. Americans are feeling this issue personally. Due to COVID with the critical lack of medical equipment to treat those protected and affected by the virus brought into clear focus the over-reliance of the manufacturing sector on overseas production. We know the offshoring issue extends beyond the pandemic concerns, reaching far larger and more permanent concerns over industrial supply chains, worker training, and national security. In Oklahoma, for example, just looking back five years to the pandemic, prior to the pandemic, we saw a hit to the state's unemployment rate or the state's employment rates. From December 2015 to June 2016, the state had a net loss of over 20,000 jobs. The state has recovered from that drop over the years, but then experienced a new monumental setback when COVID came. That's why it is exciting to see companies like Intel in announcing it is investing up to $1 billion to bring a major chip manufacturing plant to the heartland in Ohio, and it's equally exciting to hear the president's commitment to reshoring because we know many of these jobs will come to the middle of the country. It is clear the US is waking up to the fact that, is solvable that it's a solvable problem and that decisive investments in this area will go a long way for America today and long into its future. As the only think and do tank, dedicated to improving the economic performance in America's heartland. We could not be more thrilled to see this vision come to reality and to hear the phrase, 
Silicon, Silicon Heartland being uttered by Intel CEO and many others. In closing, I would like to thank the Oklahoma Policy Institute for this opportunity to share my experience and work with you today. We share in your mission of advancing equitable and fiscally responsible policies that expand opportunity for all Oklahomans through nonpartisan research analysis and advocacy. This is so vital to the success of Oklahoma. We know we can all make a difference in the place we call home. I'm proud to be sharing the Heartland Forward's work and what we are doing with my home state and look forward to continued collaboration with all of you. My hope is that with all of you, we can empower local development solutions and spur dialogue and positive action in all communities across America. Thank you so much for having me today and it's such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Angie. That was a great presentation. I actually had no idea it was $6 trillion for our total GDP. So thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for your investment in Oklahoma as Tulsa is one of our launch states for you and overall for your investment in the Heartland. Thank you. As we conclude, I just wanna say how honored we are to provide today's state budget summit as a service to help strengthen civic engagement in our state. We are especially grateful for those participants who provided donations to help us make this event and our ongoing work happen. As the only policy organization of our kind in Oklahoma, OK Policy works to ensure our state policies are developed so that all Oklahomans can live healthy lives, raise thriving families, and feel safe in their communities. These tenets are core to our work, and we appreciate the Oklahomans who have helped move to make this vision and either financially or through your volunteer support. If you would like to support our work, please visit okpolicy.org forward slash donate. As a reminder, a recording of this summit will be available later this afternoon and you can find it as well as our latest reports and again, ways to donate at our website, okpolicy.org. Donate go ai until we meet again.